with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. We're we're supposed supposed it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Now, coming up in this hour, the new MP for Rochdale, George Galloway, will be sworn into Parliament today. Oh, joy. After Rishi Sunak targeted both Islamists and far right extremists, saying democracy is under threat. This comes as we're told hate preachers will be blocked from entering the UK as the terror threat level reaches its highest since 9 11. Meanwhile, US Vice President Kamala Harris, remember her? Uh, she's called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza for at least the next six weeks in order to get hostages out and call on Israel to allow more humanitarian aid in to help starving civilians. Later in the show, I'll be talking to a survivor of the Nova Music Festival massacre on October the 7th. We had to hide in a bush for eight hours because her friends were shot dead by Hamas and terrorists. And police have solved no burglaries in nearly half of all neighbourhoods in England and Wales in the past three years. What are they doing? Doing. They're certainly not policing extremists, are they? All that to talk about, including Douglas Murray. You don't want to miss him. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. As the government prepares to unveil its last spring budget before a general election, the Chancellor has again hinted he could be on the verge of introducing more tax cuts. Jeremy Hunt and the Prime Minister have been in last-minute talks over the weekend as they face significant pressure from Tory backbenchers to win back voters. Well, Conservative MP Tobias Elwood has told Talk TV the change could be both good and bad for British people. Absolutely, we want to see tax cuts. When you reduce the tax burden um, on British business and uh, on our economy, then uh, it allows more enterprise, it allows more investment uh, in our economy, and then the, uh, we can actually see growth, and that's exactly what we want to see. But if you were to borrow money in order to provide tax cuts, that actually just hands the problem on to a future generation. Meanwhile, Jeremy Hunt and his team are facing further pressure from the motoring industry today to use the budget to help jumpstart electric vehicle sales in the UK. Leading car makers have written to Downing Street calling on the government to drop what they call unfair VAT charges on public charging points. Well, former Top Gear presenter and motoring journalist Quentin Wilson says it's an outdated fee that makes no sense. For the 38% of people who don't have driveways in this country, it's a barrier to adoption and it's slowing down the take up of electric cars. The VAT laws on this were written in the early 90s before electric cars were even a, a twinkle in Elon Musk's eyes. Nikki Haley has defeated Donald Trump in the Republican primary in Washington, D.C. It's her first victory in the 2024 campaign to become the Republican presidential candidate after winning 62.9 per cent of the vote. Her campaign says she's the first woman to win a Republican primary in U.S. history, but she still faces near impossible odds in her quest against Donald Trump. The Vice President of the United States has demanded an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, warning that people there are starving. Kamala Harris says that Israel needs to increase the flow of life-saving assistance into the region during a proposed pause in fighting. Well, she made the comments as Israel is reported to have boycotted talks with Hamas in Egypt following concerns the terror group would not provide a full list of the hostages that remained alive. Given the immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire. Yeah. For at least the next six weeks, which is what is currently on the table. This will get the hostages out and get a significant amount of aid in. 
The King's planning to make an official visit to Australia despite his cancer diagnosis. The trip, which was announced by the Australian government, will take place later this year. Their Prime Minister says his government is engaging with states and territories on options for a possible royal visit. And a Ferrari stolen from former Formula One driver Gerard Berger 28 years ago has been recovered by the Metropolitan Police. The red Ferrari F512M was one of two of the sports cars taken while their drivers were at the San Marino Grand Prix held in Italy in 1995. Well, the Met said officers received a report from the car maker in January this year after the firm had carried out checks on a car being bought by a US buyer through a UK broker last year. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazni Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. There will be plenty of dry and bright weather across northern parts of the UK for this afternoon, but from the southwest we are seeing rain, strengthening winds, and cloud moving steadily northeastwards across much of Ireland, Wales, the West Country, down towards central and southern England. So for northern and eastern parts of England, yes, it will stay mostly dry, but it does become cloudier for eastern parts of England, northern England, northern Ireland, just about, and Scotland seeing sunshine, largely dry conditions, but Shetland and Orkney will be cloudy and wet. Then overnight, that rain bank continues its journey further north and eastwards, becoming a thin band of rain really as it settles across the northeast of Scotland and the eastern seaboard of England. Elsewhere, further south and west, clear spells developing, another cold night, but not as chilly as the last night, although frost is likely to develop once again, as well as areas of mist and fog. And then further rain pushes in to the Republic of Ireland. That rain will be moving its way up towards Northern Ireland tomorrow with brisk winds again, and towards western parts of Britain, where it will turn mostly into cloudy skies and showers there. Still some rain lingering across the northeast of mainland Scotland for tomorrow afternoon. Otherwise, elsewhere, lots of sunshine and slightly milder compared to today. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. You can see my smile because it's a lovely sunny spring day. It feels like the winter is over. We're actually going to have a little bit of sunshine, a bit of light. Come on, global warming, bring it on. Joining me right now to run through all of the big stories of the day, some are rather less happy than I'm feeling right now, is a commentator, Sam Armstrong. Welcome back to the show. I haven't seen you for a while. Great to have you back. Good morning. With your new glasses. I'm liking this. Very Clark Kent. I'm liking it. We'll take Clark Kent. We'll take there you are, you see. Yeah, I, I, I can be nice occasionally. Um, right, let's uh, talk about big stuff happening in the last week, big stuff happening this week. We've got the budget to talk about. Um, and rather pointlessly, as always, the uh, the Chancellor goes on telly a few days before the budget to say, oh, I can't talk about the budget, which drives me up the wall, I have to say. We'll come to that in a few moments about what leeway he's got, what he really wants to do, given it is, by the way, Jeremy Hunt. Um, but first of all, let's talk about what happened at the end of last week. Because uh, since I've last been on air, we had the election of a one George Galloway once again for yet another different political party in yet another different seat, carpetbagger extraordinaire in Rochdale. He was elected whopping percentage of the vote, almost 40 percent. Um, and uh, he today will be uh, going into Parliament and will be sworn in uh, as, a, as an MP and... Um, be facing people like Rishi Sunak, who he says he despises in an interview afterwards uh, at PMQs this week, etc. Um, this, as Rishi Sunak on Friday night decided, maybe for the second time in his uh, premiership, once was when he became prime minister, the second time to give a speech outside Downing Street between the rainfall, talking about the need to tackle extremism on British streets. Before we discuss, I just want to play a very short clip of what Rishi Sunak had to say. Now our democracy itself is a target. Council meetings and local events have been stormed. MPs do not feel safe in their homes. Long-standing parliamentary conventions have been upended because of safety concerns. And it is beyond alarming that last night the Rochdale by-election returned a candidate who dismisses the horror of what happened on October the 7th, who glorifies Hezbollah and is endorsed by Nick Griffin, the racist former leader of the BNP. Islamist extremists and far-right groups are spreading a poison. That poison 
is extremism. It aims to drain us of our confidence in ourselves as a people and in our shared future. It was quite a, a lengthy address and it went along the, uh, that ilk. I thought a lot of people, probably including you, know, you and me, were quite surprised by the, uh, the talk about Islamist extremists and far-right groups. Far-right groups got a number of mentions. I wasn't aware that anything that happened either in Rochdale, other than the endorsement of uh, Nick Griffin, um, what happened um, in Parliament the week before when Lindsay Hill was either you know, persuaded, threatened or whatever to change parliamentary procedure uh, with MPs being threatened. Um, that's Islamic extremists, isn't it? I mean, the, the marches every other Saturday in London, I haven't seen any far-right ones. That's Islamic extremists. Why do you think when he was tackling extremism, he said, well, talking about tackling extremism, that he felt the need to mention far-right extremists too? Because this country has an unofficial blasphemy code, which says if you're going to say something about Islam, you have to say something about the far-right. Yep. Let's be really clear. There were 50% mentions there for Islamism and 50% mentions for the far-right. Let's talk about some actual facts. Over 90% of credible terrorist threats in this country come from Islamists. Over 80% of those on the terrorist watch list are, in fact, Islamists. Yes, there is a small, very small, comparatively, pocket of far-right extremists that, are, that have grown in recent years. And we want them tackled too. But that's not the issue today. Bury them under the car park, as far as I'm concerned. But calling a spade a spade matters. We have a terrorist problem in this country, and overwhelmingly it is from the Islamist, Islamists, those that want to make Islam the political basis of our country, mm -hmm. community. And it has got dramatically worse in recent months. And weekend after weekend, they are marching through London and cities across this country, making the Jewish residents of those places feel terrified yep. to walk out. And instead, what does the prime minister of this country do when he's giving a speech faced with this enormous sudden uh, insurgency? He has to create a yep. false moral equivalency. It's disgusting. It's an infection that runs through the metropolitan elite that I'm afraid are still governing yep. the vast bulk of institutions in this country. And it's fundamentally dishonest, isn't it? It is. And as you say, it is like a blasphemy law. You're not allowed to say it. And again, even you know, with the criticisms of Lee Anderson, again, I do I believe that Lee, uh, that, uh, Lee Anderson is correct to say that Sadiq can't, by the way, and London and Keir Starmer, because there was a full sentence. We played it out again and again on this show. Find out why is the media cutting out the rest of this clip uh, where he said was, it was being controlled by Islamists. No, but the Islamists want to control him. Uh, and I don't think Keir Starmer and, and Sadiq Khan controlled by them, but they're definitely influenced and fearful of them. And we see that. And we see this with the election in Rochdale of George Galloway, where he said, you know, basically, this is a victory for Gaza. I mean, by the way, George Galloway is not the MP for Rochdale. He's also not the MP for Gaza. He's the MP for George Galloway. George Galloway cares about George Galloway, and that's about it. I mean, um, but, you know, he, you know, the leafleting. Now, we've seen targeted leafleting over the years. Of course we do. Like, oh, you know, targeting, you know, families or targeting pensioners. And we've seen that with Facebook, on social media. We see it also in the actual leaflets given in different streets uh, by candidates. But the blatant targeting in largely Muslim voting areas was all about Gaza and Palestine. Indians. That was all, that's literally all that was in the leaflets. And then in, other, in whiter areas, it was basically all about, you know, save the local hospital and, 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 and Rochdale grooming gangs and, and, you know, I know what a woman is and whatever and things like that. I mean, I'm sorry. Um, it was so blatant. But, you know, the, the, the attacks, on, attacks on here, on, on Galloway, I don't like George Galloway. I don't think he's a very pleasant human being. I think he's, I think he's all about, as I say, George Galloway. But he's democratically elected. If the Labour Party can't find a candidate who doesn't spout the most brilliant, disgusting anti-Semitism. And by the way, the man is a senior figure in the local politics. So the idea they didn't know what he thought before is ridiculous. He's made his anti-Semitic comments, I mean, in blatant open public meetings and hasn't been challenged. If the Tories can't find a decent candidate, if, by the way, Reform UK can't find a, a, a candidate who hasn't, you know, texted teenagers, for goodness sake, then I'm sorry, then you deserve George Galloway. The only people who don't deserve George Galloway are the poor downtrodden people of Rochdale who've got to have a useless MP for the next few months. Look, you can win about, um, whinge about his two-track messaging, but if he wasn't right, he wouldn't have won. And the reality exactly. is... We That's have, democracy. We have parallel communities in this country. We have people that don't care about their hospitals, do care exclusively, it seems, about what is going on in the Middle East, and want this country 
to impose their own religious sense of how that region ought to be governed. And look, you had hordes running down the street intimidating people. We had two weeks ago a coup d'etat in this country. We had parliamentary democracy subverted on the basis of a horde of violent thugs that were feared to be And out it wasn't there. just the people outside, it's the people who are making the threats all the time. And we know those threats are real because we've seen terror attacks on our streets, whether it's Manchester Arena, Westminster Bridge, two in London Bridge. I mean, you know, whether it's a, an, an MP being stabbed to death, an MP being stabbed and thankfully surviving in Stephen Timms, other threats, just in... The Justice Minister doesn't trust that this state can keep him safe and is standing down as an MP, this is Mike Freer. What, how much more of a message do you need to hear? Wake up. This country is under immense danger, not only from dictators around the world that are increasingly getting viscerally and violently angry at us and threatening war in Europe and elsewhere, but also from, and I, I, I'm afraid I have to put it in these terms, I'll get criticised for it, an enemy within. Yep. There are people who live in on our streets, who go send their kids to school with your kids, that want to destroy this country, want to get, do away with its institutions, with your freedoms, its democracy. And the way you know that, two years on, the teacher at Batley Grammar Three. School in, in this country gave a perfectly ordinary religious studies class. He is living his life yep. in fear and, and violence and in hiding from the threat of a murderous and, Islamist mob. And this is the thing, because one of the things Rishi Sunak said, uh, and we are building Britain together. Um, we're a country where we love our neighbours, but I fear that our great achievement in building the world's most successful multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy is being deliberately undermined. Yet, yes, but is it successful if MPs are fearful for their lives from this? Is it successful? if MPs need to have uh, security and bodyguards? Is it successful if a teacher can't, uh, can't, can't have a teacher class as they choose? Is it successful if you can't show any film in a, in a cinema because people will threaten? I mean, at the end of the day, is it a successful democracy? And again, I, he didn't say multicultural there, but that's kind of what he meant, because I don't believe it can be successful and multicultural. I think you should have one culture, and the culture is the British culture, which is our values as a Western liberal nation. Um, and, and it, it, I, I think in such a culture, right now, I could show a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad as of, depicted in Charlie Hebdo magazine, and I wouldn't face death threats and fear for my family's safety. But I wouldn't do it because I do fear for their safety. So I, I'm being cowed. I think we should all be able to show that and people can say I don't like that because of my faith that's against my faith but I accept that you in this democracy have a right to do that but that's not what even a majority of Muslims in this country think polling has shown very clear believe that that should be an imprisonable offense well I'm sorry we don't have a blasphemy law in this country what we do have is fear of death and that is what is controlling our politics controlling our media controlling the national conversation and I think British people have said enough we're not having it anymore. I think George Galloway is something of a wake-up call to the, uh, uh, to the British, uh, you know, selectorate, uh, the, the, the media of the world, that, that actually, you know what, people are going to be looking for alternatives. I don't think he's the right alternative. By God, I don't. We're going to be talking to one of his deputies at the Workers' Party of Britain coming up very soon. But I want to hear from you. Um, Rishi Sunak vowed to tackle extremism on British streets. Apparently, they're talking about uh, not allowing in hate preachers. Um, I was under the illusion that was already something that we didn't allow, but apparently not. Um, I want to know what your reaction is to what you had to say and what is being announced today as well in terms of uh, extra security for, uh, for MPs and the like. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000, text on 8722. You can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Um, I can't wait to get to your messages on all of that. Just, I want to keep it wide open, your reaction, because... I've got to be honest, I didn't watch the speech until Saturday morning. I'll be out on the town with Mike Graham and Neen Collins and Kevin O'Sullivan for quite a long night. And um, I have to say, I mean, I was just spluttering with anger at everything that Rishi Sunak said. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what he had to say and what you think is going to be done. Um, let's though talk about the budget as well, as the Chancellor can't do, but nevertheless goes on telly do not do. And I don't know why television presenters don't just go, well, then why are you here? Why, why are you bothering? Why are you wasting our time on, on morning shows on a Sunday? He talked about a few other things, but the big issue about the budget this Wednesday is can he balance his budget? Can he cope with giving more tax cuts 
um, more, I mean, on top of the massive tax rises we've seen. Is it going to be one pence or two pence? Is it going to be on income tax? Is it going to be on national insurance, which benefits workers or including pensioners or not uh, the most? Um, and is he going to cut departmental spending? Is he, as they always focus on in these sort of budgets when they haven't got much to say, is it all going to be about tackling white hall waste? And is this all, frankly, a complete load of nonsense, Sam? Well, look, Basic facts, again, this country has the highest taxes it has had in 70 years. That's yeah. under a Tory government. And it will be the same if he cuts 1p or 2p. That figure won't yeah, change. Exactly. There are some huge other stealth tax rises that have come through in the meantime, like the thresholds, which mean that ordinary working people, police sergeants, senior nurses, are now paying higher rate tax. None of that looks right, set to be touched. I think what we're seeing at the moment is the classic Whitehall game of expectation management. management. Yes. Tell the public that you can't do anything. You, you've run out of money, you've got nothing, and then lo and behold, on Wednesday, the Chancellor pulls out that white Ta -ta. rabbit and says, look, I found an extra few billion down the back do of the Do you sofa. know anybody who even people, and again, people who are really struggling with the cost of living, which is, by the way, most people in this country, even people who thought they were quite well-off, middle-class professional earners, are really struggling. Mortgages going up, all the you know, all the bills, food, everything else has gone up. And again, when people talk about oh, inflation coming down, inflation is still sky high compared to where it normally is. Our prices aren't coming down; they're just going up at less higher rate. I mean, you know, this is basic stuff here. Uh, we aren't going to get any. We're not going to get any better off for goodness knows how many years. We're always we're always going to be worse off as a result of that inflationary boom we've had. Um, we were in a mini recession, we th then you think we might have come out of it. But do you know anybody at all who voted Tory in 2019, who has been wavering about how to vote as either a possible Labour voter, or maybe a Reform UK voter, or maybe a I don't know, I might not bother voter, who's going to say on Wednesday afternoon, oh, 2p cut in national insurance or income tax. In that case, Rishi, Jeremy, you've got my vote. Because I don't know anyone who thinks that. Look, when did our expectations of our politicians get so low? Well, having, <laughs> having, have you met these people? Having slightly lower taxes is the bare minimum we expect of Tory politicians. Instead, they've sent them sky high. The fact that they're going to bring them back down to where they were in 2022, 2021, maybe if we're good and if we're well behaved and we take the pain that Andrew Bailey's sending us, is absolutely scandalous. It is scandalous. And I am not surprised that millions of people around the country are saying, right, do you know what? Vote Tories because, yeah, we think you're all right on the economy and you keep our taxes low and that's yeah. great. But do you know what? You haven't. Yeah. So instead, that Keir Starmer, who I've got my reservations about, they will say, I'm going to give him a try instead. Because, but uh, the argument seems to be he can't be any worse. The polling is very, very clear that there's a heck of a lot of not really sure, not that keen. It's a very soft vote. Uh, the, the, the swing to Labour is very, very soft. Could be brought back. I, who knows what could bring it back? But I ain't sure there's anything Jeremy Hunt's going to announce on Wednesday that will... And I'm not entirely sure they deserve it anyway. Can I just take two couple of the topics I want to get to before the, um, we go to a call on our question about Rishi Sunak and extremes? Um, of course, Gaza. We've had Kamala Harris, the US Vice President, remember her? Um, she's been allowed out of the, uh, the, the, the the spare bedroom where she's kept locked up so she doesn't speak or be seen because the woman's clearly an idiot. Uh, she says people in Gaza are starving. Uh, she has to urge Israel to significantly increase the flow of aid there. She also called for an immediate ceasefire there for at least the next six weeks, which is what is on the table. And she, um, she said to get the Israeli hostages out, but she urged Israel, so Hamas to accept these terms. We know there's been talks and talks and talks breaking down. They're trying to bring them back. Um, certainly ahead of Ramadan starting next weekend uh, to have some sort of uh, ceasefire. Again, a ceasefire that would get out a few dozen Israeli hostages in return for, you know, 1,000-plus Palestinian prisoners. I'm not sure many people are thinking that's a great deal. Um, but um, the aid for Gazans is clearly a top priority now because I'm a staunch defender of Israel's right to defend itself as anybody. But, oh, my God, I, it is not acceptable for civilians in Gaza to be dying of malnutrition. 
No, clearly it's not, and Israel needs to do more. But I really... And, G and Egypt, by the way. Everyone and forgets Egypt. Egypt's got a border. Quite right, too. But I despair for the Palestinians if their best hope is Kamala Harris, right? This is a woman that was last put in charge with shutting the, the southern border for, for migrants, yeah. actually ended up quadrupling the amount that came, has now been sent to bring about peace in the Middle East. It, when we sometimes despair about the state of our own politicians, <laughs> it's always nice to remember that the, the US is, is led by a, a president who can't remember... Yeah his own name at times. Oh, well, at least she, she obviously read much. this, because you wouldn't be able to manage to say it otherwise, because, I mean, the woman is a complete fool. Um, but there's no doubt there's a lot of pressure from Americans. But again, that's because internal pressure in America on the Democrats as well. We see how this is impacting on international policy as well. Um, also, let's uh, talk about burglaries. Astonishing, astonishing story. So when I say astonishing, am I surprised by this? Police have failed to solve, this is amazing, a single burglary in nearly half of all neighbourhoods in England and Wales in the past three years, despite a pledge to actually attend all burglaries, which is nice of them. Again, things that we thought were a given. You might accept your burglary wouldn't be solved for a long time, but then somebody would be caught and then they'd admit to you know, 50 burglaries because, you know, no-one's just committed one. You don't get caught in your first one. Who are we kidding? Um, but the fact that they don't turn up to them, and even if they do turn up to them, they don't bother actually looking for any evidence. We have... We've decriminalised burglary. It is, it is now completely legal to go into someone's home and take their stuff and you're not going to get prosecuted for it. Brilliant. And yet, on the other hand, if you post a mean tweet yes. about a protected group, about, say, the trans community, you can be guaranteed that you're going to have a knock on the door and a dozen yeah. or more uh, officers there to investigate yeah. you and your wrong speak. Seize your computers. It's this country has got its... But, but we're going to be tackling world. extremism now. We're going to be tackling extremism. But we can't even tackle burglary, but we're going to tackle extremism. It is ludicrous. And uh, I... I I, I, you cannot blame the public for just turning around at the end of this. And I remind anybody watching, listening, 14 years of Conservative government. And you're a Conservative. And I'm a Conservative. I'm a Conservative. But, but at the end of it, uh, there are an awful lot of MPs, I'll tell you for free, that will turn around to you and tell you, I don't quite know what we've managed to achieve. I, I mean, really, I have to say, but there we are. Well, I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of that. I'm sure you've been cheering Sam on. Now, Rishi Snack has vowed to tackle extremism on British streets. I mean, say, don't worry about... You, you can burgle. What, what happens if you're an Islamist extremist or far-right extremist? Don't forget them. Apparently, they matter just as much, even though they're not actually the biggest threat. Um, uh, if, they, if they burgle a house, will they... Will the police turn up then or do you have to misgender someone in the house as you steal their items whilst waving a hammer supporting flag and then they'll turn up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm joking, but am I? But anyway, um, I, Rishi Snack vowed to tackle extremism on British streets. George Galloway's uh, being uh, sworn in as an MP today. Um, What's your reaction? Tell us what you think. Give us a call. 0344 499 1000. Text 87222. Get in touch on X at Talk TV. Well, it's a surprise that lots of you are already doing that. Stan says, I just want Rishi to tackle the cost of living crisis. Angie says, he is always all talk, never delivers. And Steve says, I'm still waiting for him to tell us who the so-called far-right extremists are. Now, you've also been getting in touch on the phones. Do please keep those calls coming in. Let's go to David, who's rang in from Sheffield. Hello, David. Hello, I've got a couple of points. Lovely, uh, go for it. On, on, on democracy. And when, when uh, Sunak talks about democracy, he's talking about a democracy what's totally foreign to me because I'm a normal working class person. I've got all the problems normal class person. He's talking about having see, uh, people working on a Sunday so middle class can go to Tesco's. That's his democracy. But what he doesn't realise is democracy takes many forms. It's not just like, you know what I mean, everything's going to be all right if I go and vote. Adolf Hitler voted into power democratically. Putin voted into, into power democratically. You can argue how you want, but if enough people vote for a certain party, whatever that is, that's a, yeah, then that's, that extremism becomes mainstream. That's, that's and, that's and that's the concern, especially when we see sectarian voting. Well, a lot of people were saying on Friday, we've not seen sectarian voting before. We have. We saw it in Northern Ireland. It still goes on in Northern Ireland. And how well has that worked out? I mean, we don't want to bring it to the rest of the British Isles. Yeah, but the point about it is it shows Tories' failings because yeah. if, if they were doing the job right, and Labour and Liberal, if they were doing, and SNP, if they were doing the job solving housing, solving food crisis, solving energy, yeah. everything else like that, they'd be voted for because people only want to be able to live and live comfortably. Yeah. Can That's I make the a thing. Point whenever whenever there is a... a point on that? 
any any growth oh. of any party that people are criticising, they will say, like, oh, you know, these are, these parties are always created by failures of the mainstream parties. When people aren't allowed to discuss major issues in this country because you just shout bigot or racist at people, even though they have a massive economic impact, like, for instance, mass immigration or, or crime impact, like, you know, illegal migration, it, they, they create... They create these things. But in terms of George Galloway, in terms of, you know, I mean, he says he despises Rishi Sunak. Rishi Sunak's talked about him, you know, in, in very derisive terms as well. Does, does that help anything? Well, you've got to understand with George Galloway, right, if you take away his beliefs on Gaza, his Saddam Hussein and stuff like that, he was a young socialist politician. Yeah. And if you would have looked at his policies, if you were a socialist, if you were poor, if you were not getting a good education, if, 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 all the way through, he would have been a man to look to. But it, people don't. They only seen the they only seen the headline grabbing things, you know, selling the same and stuff like that. Yeah. He has had a socialist background and you could find a lot of good in him. But that's not you know, that's the, that's gone now, that's what it is. But can I make okay. one point on that burden? Yeah, very briefly, really David. Yeah. Right. Everybody's been telling please don't come. Well we have a spare to burglars where we live. So we've got like your adult neighborhood watch. And one of the things we do is we contact our MP. Contact our MP and say, look, we've got problems, we've yep. got photos. We've have you had any response? Like that. And since then, we've actually had police officers. Because oh, you contact the MP, the MP bothers the out, chief constable. Yeah, and then... Out and say, you know, what's should, happened? Have shouldn't have photos? to do that, though, should you? Yeah. David, I'm going to have to leave it there, but thank you so much for calling. I really appreciate it. That's David uh, in uh, Sheffield there. Coming up after the break, more from Sam Armstrong and the new MP for Rochdale, uh, George Galloway, is going to be sworn into Parliament today after Rishi Sunak targeted both Islamists and far-right extremists, saying democracy is under threat. Uh, we're going to be talking to one of George Galloway's deputies up next. I'm Julia Hartley-Burr. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, the new MP for Rochdale, George Galloway, is to be sworn into Parliament today after Rishi Sunak targeted both Islamist and far right extremists, saying democracy is under threat. It comes as today we found out that hate preachers will be blocked from entering the UK. I mean, I thought they already were. Uh, joining me uh, right now is the one of the three deputy leaders of the Workers' Party of Great Britain, that is Peter Ford, makes him a deputy, of course, to George Galloway, the new uh, and only MP for the Workers' Party. Uh, good morning to you, Peter. Uh, well, thank you for having me, uh, Julia. Uh, you're my heroine, um, not least for your brave appearances on Question Time. Well, uh, where... I, this, this was not how I thought this uh, interview was going to start, Peter. I, I'm not going well, to I'm lie. I'm just going to tell you, um, I'm a big supporter of yours on the climate nonsense. Well, OK, we've got something in common. Can I just say, the bit of a problem with your volume um, on your, your speaker, I don't know whether there's a, 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 the, the, the microphone is moving or what's going on there, but um, if we can um, keep... Can, the, can you hear that's me? That's much better, better right. Now? That's, that's, let's leave it like that. Don't move. Don't do anything different. We can hear you now. Right. Let's talk about this. Um, the Prime Minister, after the election of your colleague, George Galloway, on, on early hours of Friday morning, um, had basically been you know, pretty critical of, of George Galloway. Um, he, uh, he said it's beyond alarming that last night he said the Rochdale by-election returned a candidate who dismisses the horror of what happened on October the 7th, who glorifies Hezbollah and is endorsed by Nick Griffin, the racist former leader of the BMP. In return, George Galloway in an interview said he despises the Prime Minister. Um, is this the sort of politics that will help improve the country? Yes. Well, it was shocking that the Prime Minister saw fit to attack uh, a new MP who had just been returned with an avalanche of, of votes. Um, I think it was disrespectful towards the electorate. It was undignified. And then he went on to dig himself into a bigger hole by talking about extremism. I, I was in Rochdale. I was in the, the campaign, I can tell you. There was no extremism on display. And what Sunak is doing is trying to whip up hysteria in the hope of rescuing Tory fortunes. It's politicizing of the situation with the Muslim community. It's quite shameful and dangerous. But George um, enters parliament today. It's a new dawn. It's a bright day. And he's looking forward Okay. to having an impact. I mean, I'm sorry, the only people who were exploiting the, you know, the, 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 this issue what, what was your party, was George Galloway. I've seen the leaflets that were sent to different streets in different wards. So if you were in a largely white ward, you got a letter all about the local hospital and maternity services and the Rochdale grooming gangs and, and tackling those issues. If you lived in a largely Muslim uh, ward, you got a letter all about how this was all about Gaza. When... When George Galloway was elected, his first thing, he said, this is victory for Gaza. This, he's going to be the MP for Gaza rather than the MP for Rochdale. Rochdale is a, a, a town with huge social and economic problems, huge issues that need to be dealt with, both historic and more recent. Having an MP who is obsessed with what happens thousands of miles away in Gaza isn't going to help those people. It's George Galloway, it's your colleague in, the, in your party, who has politicised this, not the Prime Minister. Uh, Julia, uh, George was uh, echoing the concerns of the people of Rochdale. Uh, many of them, in, in all the wards, and I tramped the streets, I can tell you it wasn't just the Muslims, in all the wards were concerned about Gaza, which is top of the news, has been for months on end. It's not unreasonable that the people of Rochdale should want to know what's the position of the candidates on is that it, no, I'm issue. sorry, it, there's a difference between something being top of the news and something being a major issue in a local election, a by-election. I mean, I know, for instance, if there was a by-election in the, the, the North London seat where I lived, I'd be more concerned about, you know, whether there was going to be pressure to get more bin collections. Um, and, you know, the, the, the 20 mile per hour limit on major streets and things like that. I'd bet building more housing for local families. I'd be more concerned about that than I would about 
what's happening in Gaza. I can still be concerned about Gaza, you know, as a human being, as a journalist, but it wouldn't be how I'd made my vote. Why, have, why has divisive Middle Eastern politics why has it found its place in British politics in such a divisive way that we've even seen, you know, the impact on our democratic institution in Parliament where MPs are feeling pressured on how to vote a certain way on British foreign policy because of violent threats from those extremists who apparently don't really exist? Uh, Julia, you should pay more attention. Do better research. You will have seen that George made a big thing of maternity services or I've lack just of... I've just literally mentioned that a few minutes ago. ...and many other local issues. Not, not, uh, in, the honestly, leaflet, not in the leaflet to Muslim homework. homes, he didn't. The leaflet to Muslim homes was about, was about Gaza. I've read both leaflets. Many, many of the people of Gaza were very concerned the about people, uh, Gaza. The people of uh, Gaza. We make no yeah, you are, you see. Now, that. wasn't that a wonderful Freudian slip? The people of Gaza are concerned about Gaza. No, they're the people of Rochdale. They're concerned about getting a job, being able to buy a home one day, getting social housing, their kids getting a good education, whether their bins are collected, whether they can get a hospital operation. But, but he wasn't talking about that to the Muslim voters. He only talked about that to the white voters. I've no doubt at all he appealed an awful lot to a lot of white voters. A lot of the things he was talking about on those, those, those uh, leaflets, I thought, yeah, I'd agree with that, I'd agree with that. Um, but, but nevertheless, it, this was a completely divided election. Here's the thing, though. What is he going to do in Parliament that is going to change anything for either the people of Rochdale or the people of Gaza? Uh, you're talking nonsense, uh, Julia. G George uh, spoke about the NHS, uh, about taxes, uh, about cost of living, and all the other issues that are at the top of people's minds. It wasn't just about Gaza. Get that into your head. I was there. Were you there? I can tell you. Day after day, George was not just talking about Gaza, and now he's in Parliament. He will do more. Okay, so what's he going to do? What's he going to do? Ordinary workers, ordinary working class people about uh, all their daily concerns. But war is a concern. It's top of the news every day, day after day, for a reason. This war in Ukraine, this war on behalf of Israel, is costing us hundreds of millions of pounds. The people of Britain are not happy about that. If we were less involved in wars, we'd have more money for the NHS. Less involved in wars. We're not involved in the war in Gaza. Are you wrong, Julian? We're we fighting the war in Gaza, are we? The cost of having a navy, Royal Navy patrol in the Red Sea is zero. Do some investigative we, we have the Royal work. Navy patrols. The, the, the Royal Navy patrols seas and oceans, millions. whether there's a war or not. Do you think the Royal Navy shouldn't patrol when Houthi rebels fire on, on international and British shipping? Do you think they should just go, oh, never mind, that's fine? The British government are spending hundreds of millions of pounds on the defence of Israel. Oh, we need to ask the people of this country whether they're happy with that when the money could be better spent elsewhere. You think the Royal Navy is not cheap. The Royal Air Force, which is flying regularly into uh, Israeli airports with fresh supplies is not cheap. Intelligence support for Israel is not cheap. So we, we shouldn't be supporting our, our democratically so elected allies when they are under, we, then when they are attacked then? Sorry, didn't catch we that. We shouldn't support our democratically elected allies when they're attacked. Is that what you're saying? Uh, as far as I know, uh, Israel isn't an ally. It's uh, not you don't think Israel's an ally? I'm pretty sure Israel's an ally of this country and everyone in the West, yes. Well, are you going to question whether it's a democratically elected government as well? Should we go full conspiracy and most theory? People, as demons, it's just sour grapes, uh, Julia, because you got trounced in the Rochdale election. I you don't. I, it was the who, first what, I didn't stand as a candidate. I don't hold it a candle for any of the candidates who stood in that by I, I think it was an absolute travesty for the you're, people you're of Rochdale in terms of what was on offer to them. The election of someone who was voicing the concerns of millions of ordinary we, British people. And Palestinians. You were trounced. Your side were oh, no, trounced. No, 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 no I wasn't. No, my side. Up. No, I didn't Cut have a side up, in the Rochdale by-election other than the people of Rochdale. 
I don't like George Galloway. I think I George think Galloway upset, only cares about George Galloway. I don't like you a man who point. I don't like a that man who not. sucks up to Middle East dictators and uh, and and who, who 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 spouts the stuff he spouts. No, I'm not a fan. But I totally respect the fact that he was able to get himself elected. He got himself elected. If the other parties couldn't stand a better candidate than him, they deserve to lose. I've got no issue with that. Oh, we got, we've got you back. Uh, but, but, but fundamentally, I, I want to know, what is he going to do for those people? Have we got Peter Ford back? We've got a problem with his link, I think. Right. What is he going to do to improve the lives of people in Rochdale and or people in Gaza who he thinks he represents? What he's going to do is articulate the concerns of millions of ordinary people, both about the situation in the Middle East and their regular concerns, not least things like net zero. We are the only party represented now in Parliament which is calling for a referendum on net zero. Uh, he'll be talking about the concerns of the, the Welsh uh, farmers who are up in arms and having to take to the streets in their tractors because their industry is being destroyed in the name of net zero. That's okay, I mean, look, we, we, we'll agree on we'll agree up. on that issue, but but you know, well, do tell him, do tell lovely George to unblock me because he's done that petulant blocking thing, and then he's very welcome to come on and talk about sensible things like that. We're going to have to leave it there because time is against us. Peter Ford, thank you very much for joining us. He is uh, one of the three deputy leaders of the Workers' Party of Britain, which is of course uh, George Galloway's party. Um, Still with me in the studio um, uh, is Sam Armstrong. I don't, I don't know if we got anywhere there, um, really, but um, what did you make of that, what he had to say? Well, look, this is the problem with George. On the one hand, he's a brilliant debater, orator, speaker, generally. I, I watch him and I think it's mad. Oh, I find him... I don't find him a good speaker at all. He combines that with some good policies, right? Mm. Net zero, farming... Knows what a woman is. Knows what a woman is. But then, interwoven, you get crazed conspiracy theories. The RAF, the Royal Navy are at war in Gaza. It's yeah. nonsense. And, and the defence of Saddam Hussein, Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Again, a man who claims desperately to care about the plight of Muslims, except when other Muslims are mass killing them. It's very bizarre, isn't it? It's only when Israelis are killing Muslims that he seems to care about them. He's a little, Funny that. He's a little bit like the pub bore. He says some good things and then he goes completely mad and you can't shut him up. <laughs> Indeed. Well, he's going to be in Parliament later. We'll see what happens. Uh, now, as I say, Rishi Snack is about to tackle extremism on British streets. This uh, so George Galloway is going to be sworn into Parliament. Your reaction, please. Give us a call on 0344 499 Text 87222. Get in touch on X at Talk TV. Alice says, my reaction is, I don't believe him. Sarah says, get on with it then. Too much talk not enough action. This is something of a theme in all of the messages we get on every topic. And Thomas says they will generate new anti-extremism laws that will strip away the rights and freedoms of UK citizens while doing nothing to actually reduce real extremism. Totally nailed it. 100%. Coming up after the break, police have solved no burglaries at all in nearly half of all neighbourhoods in England and Wales in the past three years. We're going to talk to a former police officer about that. He'll be tearing his hair out as much as you and I are. I'm Julia Hartley-Brew. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brew, and you are with Talk TV. Now, astonishing headline today. Or is it astonishing? That's the question. Police have sold no burglaries in nearly half of all neighbourhoods in England and Wales in the past three years. It, I, mean, just, I mean, I can't even imagine that that would be a headline we'd have read 20 years ago and not just laughed out loud thinking it was a spoof. But no, it's true. Joining me now to discuss this is Peter Blexley, former Scotland Yard and Met Police detective, old sister with a Sam Armstrong. Um, Peter, were you surprised when you saw this headline, or was it just like, well, yeah, that's we just we just don't investigate and solve burglaries anymore. That's we know that now. First of all, I was enraged. Second, I was aghast, <laughs> and then thirdly, no, I suppose I probably wasn't surprised because this is the perfect illustration of just how useless in so many regards British policing is. But what are, what are they... OK, here's the thing. We, we talk about this crackdown on extremism. Well, they ain't, they ain't cracking down on extremism yet. We know that. All the things the Prime Minister talked about, saying we mustn't allow things to be allowing, although apparently the laws exist to stop them. Um, they're, not, they're not really tackling things like rapes. They're not, because we know, you know, right there, we, they're, not, they're not tackling burglaries. Everyone I know has had a mobile phone or a bike stolen, says the police literally go, we're not interested. So what are the police doing all day? It's a very good question. Are they just all dancing at Pride marches all day? They don't know, essentially, what they are. They don't know whether they're a, a social service or whether they're a crime-fighting force. And when I say social service, they're a bit like the AA and the RA. If, RAC, if your car breaks down, you call yeah. them. When society breaks down, the police get And it's caught. not really their fault, because if, you know, they're dealing with a lot of people who are severely mentally ill. We've had police chiefs say, we can't do, deal with this anymore. We haven't got time to deal with... To do it with crime. Manifestly is their fault. Wow. They've allowed themselves to be drawn down this path. Those weak, liberal, highly educated intelligentsia that prowl the corridors of policing power allowed it to get to this state. Because, of course, so many of those senior police officers, with all the degrees to their names and all the Oxbridge education that so many of them have had, couldn't essentially tell the difference between a burglar and a pomegranate. <laughs> they, have, they have no experience of front so that, they're line. They're not on the front line. But even, my thing is, even whether you've gone to uni or not gone to uni, whether you started out, you know, as a cadet and you worked your way up, whether you are left-wing or right-wing, liberal or liberal, I, I don't understand why anyone doesn't get the, that you need to police crime and that people going into someone else's house and stealing the stuff that they've bought with their hard-earned wages 
is a crime and something that needs to be tackled and dealt with. And given that we know that all of this is drug related, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's often organised crime related. And so, you know, the same people are responsible again and again. You can knock, you can lock up 100 people in any local neighbourhood. You'd basically solve pretty much all acquisitive crime because it's the same people doing it. And they know who the people are, but they, they don't even tackle people who are walking into shops with CCTV camera and going, I'll have that, thank you, and walking out, even when they know their name. So have they just completely given up on policing? Do they not believe that crime is a bad thing? What, but, what, what, do they, what do they think their job is anymore? Well, 14 years after the start of the age of austerity, they will still blame that. Yeah. And, of course, they will say that their frontline officers are very busy answering 999 calls because that's essentially what they do. They go yeah. from one call to another. But senior police, for getting on for 20 years or more now, dismantled the detective branch. They thought it was all too elitist. Those burglary <laughs> squads, the robbery squads, who knew... So who highly the local... experienced, highly skilled officers. Yes. Too elitist. Who okay. knew how to catch burglars, who knew where the problematic drug users were that would be climbing through your kitchen window this afternoon, that knew all of that and kept a bit of a lid on crime yeah. and therefore made the streets a hostile environment yeah. for criminals. That, that, that's gone. They've dismantled But that. we have, to all intents and purposes, we've, we've basically legitimised stealing stuff from other people's homes, haven't we? You can steal a bike, steal a phone. You, you, can, also, you can steal from a shop. But shoplifting isn't really crime that actually gets prosecuted in any meaningful way now. And now burglary. We, we're just going to say it's just OK now. And having sat with so many burglary victims over the years... So traumatising. ..I can tell you how deeply, deeply traumatising it is. That invasion, an Englishman's home is his castle until it gets invaded by some unscrupulous, thieving burglar. And I've known people who have simply never been able to return to yeah. their home. Yeah, I know, I know people who've had mental breakdowns as a result of it because it's been so traumatic, especially if your home is trashed as well, you don't feel safe. It's a very big issue. And yet we're saying that, the, that we're hearing from the Prime Minister it's going to be able to tackle things like, you know, extremism, you know, hate preachers are to be blocked from entering the UK and things like that. If they can't tackle, you know, the, 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 the local burglar going in and stealing, or drug addict stealing from someone's home, how are they going to be able to tackle these people? They're not. And the reason, one of the many reasons they're not is because of the appalling standard of training and yeah. supervision. But you see, all of that baby got thrown out with the bathwater by this lot who are now in charge. Yeah. They said police officers don't need to know the law yeah. off by heart. Yeah. Of course yeah. they do. Of course, as we said, often don't know. Sam Armstrong, brief word from you. Yeah, well, th there is another group of people to blame, of course. I do feel sorry for the police in some ways. They nick someone, they can hold them for 24 hours, the CPS don't charge them for 44 days, they send someone up to the beaks for burglary, theft, whatever, and they're getting a slap on the wrist, sent away again, and we seem to have a criminal justice system as well, courts that don't yeah. want to deal with yeah, this well, kind we'll of crime. Say, yeah, what's the point? If, what's the point of arresting? That's, that's the argument of the shoplifters. They know perfectly well they're not even going to get a fine. So what's, what's the sodding point? Unfortunately, we're going to have to come back to that, but I know we will, Peter. What's the sodding point? There you go. That's the new strap line for the entire show. What's the sodding point anymore? Peter Blexi, thank you very much. More from Sam Armstrong coming up. Don't forget Douglas Murray on the show a bit later as well. Coming up after the break, though, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says he's got a moral duty to cut taxes as he attempts to fund a 2p reduction in income tax. Oh, yes, and the palace has criticised the madness of social media as conspiracy theories about the Princess of Wales' health circulate online. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid 
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement. If you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, I'm going to talk more about the new MP for Rochdale, George Galloway. He's going to be sworn into Parliament today. This after Rishi Sunak targeted both Islamists and far right extremists, saying democracy is under threat. I'll give your reaction to that. And this all comes ahead of Wednesday's budget when the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says he has a moral duty to cut taxes as he attempts to fund a 2p reduction of either income tax or national insurance, but would it make a difference to your wallet? And the work Buckingham Palace has criticised the madness of social media as conspiracy theories abound about the Princess of Wales' health online. This after she underwent abdominal surgery six weeks ago. First though, let's get the latest news headlines with Natalia Hulkera. Good morning. As the government prepares to unveil its last spring budget before a general election, the Chancellor has hinted that he could be on the verge of introducing more tax cuts. Jeremy Hunt and the Prime Minister have been in last-minute talks over the weekend as they face significant pressure from Tory backbenchers to win back voters. Conservative councillor for Epping, Holly Whitbread, has told Talk TV she thinks the public supports cuts despite potentially having to pay for them later down the line. I think people would like to see a little bit of a reward for the pain they've had to experience in, in recent years. But without a doubt, Jeremy Hunt is his style to be sensible. Mm. And I think that is the right thing at the moment because we're living through such extraordinary times and we still have to pay for the pandemic and there's still other pressures that need to be paid for as well. Meanwhile, Jeremy Hunt and his team are facing further pressure from the motoring industry today to use the budget to help jumpstart electric vehicle sales in the UK. Leading car makers have written to Downing Street, calling on the government to drop what they call unfair VAT charges on public charging points. Former Top Gear presenter and motoring journalist Quinton Wilson says it's an outdated fee that makes no sense. For the 38% of people who don't have driveways in this country, it's a barrier to adoption and it's slowing down the take up of electric cars. The VAT laws on this were written in the early 90s before electric cars were even a, a twinkle in Elon Musk's eyes. The Vice President of the United States has demanded an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, warning that people there are starving. Kamala Harris says that Israel needs to 
sense the flow of life-saving assistance into the region during a proposed pause in fighting. She made the comments as Israel is reported to have boycotted talks with Hamas in Egypt following concerns the terror group would not provide a full list of hostages that remain alive. Nikki Haley has defeated Donald Trump in the Republican primary in Washington, D.C. It is her first victory in the 2024 campaign to become the Republican presidential candidate after winning 62.9 percent of the vote. Her campaign says she's the first woman to win a Republican primary in U.S. history, but she still faces near impossible odds in her quest against Donald Trump. The King is planning to make an official visit to Australia despite his cancer diagnosis. The trip, which was announced by the Australian government, will take place later this year. Their Prime Minister says his government is engaging with states and territories on options for a possible royal visit. The RNLI is celebrating saving more than 146,000 lives as it marks its 200th anniversary. A service of thanksgiving is being held today at Westminster Abbey, with representatives from the charity from across the UK and Ireland attending. Talk TV correspondent Nick Ellaby is at one of the newest and busiest RNLI stations in Chiswick, West London. And also recently we've had the RNLI dragged into the culture wars as well with politicians like Nigel Farage calling it a glorified taxi service for illegal migrants, picking them up in the channel. Well, only 3% of RNLI call-outs are to do with those small boats. And as you mentioned, 238 stations all around the country, mostly on beaches. And two horses caused havoc for motorists in Cleveland when they decided to run across America's busiest motorway. The pair brought cars to a standstill when they trotted onto the I-90. Officers there say they belonged to the police and had somehow managed to escape from their stables. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. There will be plenty of dry and bright weather across northern parts of the UK for this afternoon, but from the southwest we are seeing rain, strengthening winds, and cloud moving steadily northeastwards across much of Ireland, Wales, the West Country, down towards central and southern England. So for northern and eastern parts of England, yes, it will stay mostly dry, but it does become cloudier for eastern parts of England, northern England, northern Ireland, just about, and Scotland seeing sunshine, largely dry conditions, but Shetland and Orkney will be cloudy and wet. Then overnight that rain bank continues its journey further north and eastwards, becoming a thin band of rain really as it settles across the northeast of Scotland and the eastern seaboard of England. Elsewhere, further south and west, clear spells developing, another cold night, but not as chilly as the last night, although frost is likely to develop once again, as well as areas of mist and fog. And then further rain pushes in to the Republic of Ireland. That rain will be moving its way up towards Northern Ireland tomorrow with brisk winds again, and towards western parts of Britain, where it will turn mostly into cloudy skies and showers there. Still some rain lingering across the northeast of mainland Scotland for tomorrow afternoon. Otherwise, elsewhere, lots of sunshine and slightly milder compared to today. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Lots to talk about this morning. Still with me running through all the top stories is commentator Sam Armstrong. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, just to flag up what's coming up a bit later in the show, we are going to be talking to one of the survivors of the October 7th massacre at the Nova Festival, a woman who, as her friends were being shot dead, had to hide for eight hours to try and keep herself alive. Harrowing, harrowing story. We must never forget, as people talk of ceasefires and that, we must never forget how this all started. And yes, it did start on October the 7th. Not going back 75 years, I'm afraid. Um, I'm also going to be talking to Douglas Murray. He'll be uh, here uh, talking about what the Prime Minister had to say about extremism. And I'm also asking you about that as well. Uh, Rishi Sunak vowed to tackle extremism on British streets. Interestingly, he also talked about far-right extremism in his address to the nation on Friday night, as well as Islamist extremism, even though not entirely sure that that is the threat uh, that he thinks it is. It certainly doesn't seem to be according to the police or indeed to the uh, security services or, or to, well, anyone who's experienced extremism on our streets in recent months because that's overwhelmingly Islamist extremism. So 
Why did he mention that as well? Love to hear your thoughts. What's your reaction? Do you think he will tackle it? Is it all just words, no action? A lot of you are saying that. Give us a call. 0344 499 1000 is the number to have your say on air. You can text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Well, somebody doesn't have to message in, as I say, uh, is Sam Armstrong uh, joining us. Um, I, I, I was, I mean, I have to say, I didn't watch his speech until the Saturday morning because why ruin a Friday night? Um, and I, I, I sat and watched it in full um, with my husband and we were just shouting at my phone as it played out. We just sort of, it's just talk, it's just nonsense. And how we're such a multi, successful multi-ethnic, he didn't say multicultural, interesting, multi-ethnic society. So successful that we've got, you know, a teacher in Batley who's still in hiding three, four years on after just simply showing a cartoon to his students. So, 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 so we're just so integrated, everything's so great. Uh, that we uh, we don't have basically sort of you know Italy sign warfare on our streets at times that we haven't got pop, you know parliamentarians being threatened, MPs needing bodyguards, parliamentary procedure being changed. Um, I mean people being elected, George Galloway being elected, basically pretending he's the MP for Gaza as opposed to the MP of an impoverished town like Rochdale, desperately in need of an MP to champion their causes. Um, there is nothing the Prime Minister said that was true, is there? No, he fundamentally failed to rise to the scale of events, to the occasion. Let's be clear about what this recent weeks mean. Recent weeks mean that this country has ceased to be a functioning democracy. I mean that. We have changed parliamentary procedure because of violent mobs. We have imposed blasphemy laws in our country, not because people voted for them, not because they wanted to... we voted to get rid of them. In fact, we, our own sovereign parliament, uh, repealed those very laws many years ago, but we have brought them in by the back door. We've suspended parliamentary process by the back door because of the threat of a marauding mob that descends on our capital every weekend, pitches up outside our elected representatives' homes, bullies, threatens, with the underlying threats that you push back against us too hard. One of our young members will turn up at your constituency surgery and stab you to death. And we know that they will do that because they've done it before, because Sir David that he, he was stabbed to death. Stephen Timms, thankfully, survived. Numerous other threats, numerous other court cases have gone to court. But no, no, let's all talk about Joe Cox and the threat of far-right extremists and Thomas Mayer. I mean, you, 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 will, you Google David Amos and Joe Cox's names, I will tell you which one comes out from it, even though it's so much further ago, and that it was a very isolated, horrible, horrible, awful murder. Um, but nevertheless, more of an isolated threat than a growing issue on our streets. Well, look, let's play a little bit of a clip of what um, Rishi Snack had to say when he talked about agreeing with you there that our democracy itself is a target. Here's what he said. Now our democracy itself is a target. Council meetings and local events have been stormed. MPs do not feel safe in their homes. Long-standing parliamentary conventions have been upended because of safety concerns. And it is beyond alarming that last night the Rochdale by-election returned a candidate who dismisses the horror of what happened on October the 7th, who glorifies Hezbollah and is endorsed by Nick Griffin, the racist former leader of the BNP. Islamist extremists and far-right groups are spreading a poison. That poison is extremism. It aims to drain us of our confidence in ourselves as a people and in our shared future. Um, you know what's draining the confidence in ourselves and our future? It's not the exam extremists, it's the abject failure of our political media and ruling class to stand up to it. Because there's this, I mean, I, I actually talked the other day about, you know, people waking up to this and had you know, people like Tommy Robinson saying, oh, actually, we've all been awake up. I've been writing about this stuff and talking about this stuff since about the year 2000. I was being called horrible, you know, bigger, uh, xenophobic, everything, to say, maybe mass uncontrolled immigration isn't a good thing because people can't assimilate uh, and, uh, and integrate on mass. It, it, it's, it's not a race issue. It's not a xenophobic issue. It is simply a matter of socioeconomic fact that is not the case. Um, but, but it's the abject failure of our political classes to allow any debate on this without just shouting out the R word at everybody, to actually face up to what it is. We've had report after report, whether it's Louise Casey under David Cameron, or, or every other report saying, we've basically got different groups in society living side by side. Now, that is, I think that's just as much an issue for our cultural um, uh, coming, sort of coming together and, 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 uh, and glue as when it's a, when it's a, for instance, um, you know, uh, uh, extreme 
Jewish group or or Hindus or Sikhs or 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 or, or Polish people or whatever group. Because I think that people should be living side by side with people of every single different, you know, viewpoint of things. We shouldn't be in ghettos. But it is a particular issue when it is a Muslim community where there is still this Islamic extremism, which is huge in countries like Pakistan, countries uh, like across the Middle East, where it's absolutely vast and many other countries where Muslims emigrate to this country from. And everyone being uncomfortable about saying that is where I, what has got us into this issue. Importing people who, although the majority may well share all of our values and want to come here and make a good life and set their kids into good schools, work hard, brilliant, welcome, come on in. But where there is a far too large minority of people, and it's not, it's not 10 people, it's not even 10,000 people, it's hundreds of thousands of people who genuinely what, ascribe to this political Islamic ideology, which is very different in position of Sharia law, um, anti-democracy, anti-Western anti liberal values. We need a leadership, political, police, media, uh, cultural, to say, no. This isn't what we want. This isn't acceptable to us. And if you don't want to join with our values here, you're not welcome here. But, Julia, we have leaders that are so cowardly, they are so cowardly, that rather than change, tackle that community, they are instead prepared to change us. Yes. The rest of well, us... Well, they're not prepared to. They told us. ...in order to appease. I mean, just look at what the government are actually doing in response to all this. They say it's a huge problem. What are they doing in response? Over the weekend, it was reported that anyone now trying to get into Parliament, despite the fact you have to go through airport star security already, is now going to have to show photo ID. Yeah. That they are kicking Lee Anderson out of the Conservative party. For, Suella for, Braverman got sacked as Home Secretary. Suella Braverman was getting sacked. Um, they're, they're reheating decades-old Blairite policies, this banning extremists from coming into the country. This is a policy that Tony Blair introduced, right? Yeah. This, this government is now so left-wing that it's re-announcing Tony Blair's policies yeah. in an attempt to seem right-wing. This is a disgrace. We are changing the entirety of what it means to be British in order to appease a subset of our society that hates us. Yeah. But also, this, it's this idea that diversity is all strength. Diverse, no. Di Diversity isn't a good thing of itself. It's not a bad thing of itself. It depends what you're being diverse about. People are having a range of views, all of which are democratic and, and accept, you know, that other people are allowed to hold different views. That's the key thing. I don't mind if, for instance, someone thinks that an image of Prophet Muhammad is a deep offence to them and it should not be shown. You're entitled to think that. I will march on the streets for your right to believe that. But you're not allowed to tell me I can't show an image. You're not allowed to tell me that you'll kill me and my family if I showed an image or you'll firebomb my building. And so I end up in a situation where I wouldn't do it, not because I think it's wrong, it's because I'm frightened. There's no, and that's not acceptable. There's no doubt that multiculturalism has brought some benefits to this country. But if you think that multiculturalism is such an unfettered benefit, if you think that bringing in all of these groups with their different ideologies, uh, not uh, attempting in any way to integrate them into our society, why is it that today you cannot, by way of example, walk down 10 Downing Street? Look at some old clips yeah. of, of people in uh, this country. You could walk yeah. up to the door of where the Prime the Minister the of Great Britain and Northern Ireland lives. Today, you don't get within a country mile. There are police officers with firearms everywhere around. This country has got more dangerous in the last 30, 40 years. Why? Yeah. Oh, I think it's far-right extremists. I think you'll find... If you're, I'm just going to check the Prime Minister's speech again. I mean, that's the thing. No, we're going to talk to Ian Duncan Smith about this as well. I also want to hear from you. He's vowed to... The Prime Minister's vowed to tackle extremism on British streets. I want to know what your reaction is. Give us a call. 0344 499 1000. Text on 87222. Get in touch on X at Talk TV. I'm going to read some of those uh, messages out in just a couple of moments. First up, though, let's talk about another rather big event this week. Not just... No, it's not all about George Galloway, amazingly enough, it getting uh, sworn in as, a, as an MP. Uh, it is the budget on Wednesday. Um, I don't know if anyone's expecting anything very big. We've had the usual nonsense uh, ahead from the Treasury leaks. Again, I'm from a dime when, you know, if, if the budget was leaked, you, everyone would have to resign. But no, Brian, the, the Chancellor goes on telly and says, we can't talk about the budget. And these hints about whether it's going to be a 1p or a 2p cut in income tax or national insurance. Bearing in mind, national insurance will help people who are workers, but not, say, richer pensioners who are paying higher tax. Um, but, um, but again, you don't get quite the political 
sort of flag waving uh, for a cut in national insurance because a lot of people don't even know what that is, they don't notice it. But the reality is, even if there is a cut of one or two P, frankly, even three or four P, people will still be worse off from the tax rises they've already seen, the tax thresholds staying the same when people's wages are going up because of inflation. Everything's going up in cost. It ain't coming down anytime soon. I mean, even the inflation we've got now is still seeing price prices going up considerably every year. People are still going to go into the election, whether it's May or October, going, I am poorer than I used to be. Do you think they're going to win a single extra vote by cutting these taxes? Well, look, I suspect they're probably going to cut more, actually, than expected. That's always That's the way the expectation it works. Management. They play it down and then they cut more. But it won't make a scintilla of difference. It, he can put taxes up or down. He's still going to have more money out of your pocket than he would have done at the start of this parliament. Yeah. And that's before you factor in the fact that the cost of living has exploded. And just one last time, can we remind ourselves why the country ran out of money? Why the cost yeah. of everything ballooned, OK? Was it because of uh, some strange, bizarre event? Or was it perhaps because we decided to lock down the entire country and to keep the economy going while everyone's saying, oh, it's wonderful, we don't need to go to work and we can still own the same amount? No, yeah. we were printing money like never before and now we're paying for every single penny and, of it. And it is extraordinary to see Labour talking about this. They're saying about you know, how bad the finances are and how bad things have been and the cuts in, in real terms in lots of departments and public spending. You're just like, sorry, hold on a minute. Sorry. The Tories came in in 2010 after the major economic crash, largely as a result, in my view, of, of um, deregulation carried out under the Tony Blair Gordon Brown years of our banking system. I don't think they've done anything to fix it particularly, but um, you know, I think we'll, we'll end up seeing that sort of thing again. Found to fix that. They got re-elected in 2015, a bigger vote, you know, not just a, a minority government, but a majority government, and again in 2015 and in 2019. And then we had all the shenanigans over Brexit, which basically stalled all government thought for two or three years. Um, and, then, and then we had lockdown, supported by Labour, not even just supported, egged on, urged to be longer, deeper, sooner, you know, you name it. And now they're going, oh, oh, the finance is in a terrible state. You think, yeah, no beep, Sherlock. Yeah, this is an, this is an economic recovery plan bought, brought to you by the people that flogged the gold when it was uh, at the lowest price ever and delivered the biggest recession that this country had seen for almost a hundred years. That said, I still hold the Tories responsible for what they did. That's, they are responsible for what they did. Uh, Theresa May uh, over Brexit um, and, of course... Um, you know, the, the, you know, Rishi Sunak was Chancellor, Gore, Boris Johnson was Prime Minister during what they did during lockdowns. Um, we are where we are. Um, you don't think it's going to make any difference? Some days I wish we could just have a complete start over with our entire political classes. Let's just, let's just, let's just change the deck. Let's just new, new balls, thanks, please. Thanks. Yeah, you, know, yes. you know sometimes when you're playing, you're playing yes. patience and you go, oh, these cards are just... I'm just going to give up. I'm not going to get anywhere. Start it. Just, just start again. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, let's also uh, talk about Kamala Harris try not to do that as much as possible. Indeed, it's interesting. Uh, if, even the Biden administration tries not to talk about the vice president as often as possible. She gave a speech yesterday calling for Hamas to agree to an immediate ceasefire in Gaza for at least six weeks, but also urged uh, Israel uh, to send in more humanitarian aid. No one ever seems to ask Egypt to do this. Egypt also share a border. It's up to them. They're busy building their border even higher. There is no doubt at all that, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the Gaza civilians are dying. They are, they are diving bombs. They're also, children are now dying as a result of starvation. That is not acceptable, that we should not stand by and say that that's OK. Um, but um, when the US fly in, you know, 38,000 meals to a population of 2 million plus, I mean, I'm sorry, that's, that's an insult. We need to have aid going in on a mass scale, do we not? We know Hamas steal a lot of it, but even so. Well, but come on, Julia, we've got to be clear on this particular point. The reason that so many Gazan civilians are getting shot is because Hamas used them as human shields. The reason that there is not a lot of aid getting into Gaza is because Hamas take the aid, they don't give it to the people, and in fact, if you send them a, a, a roll of kitchen foil, they'll somehow turn away, use it to turn it into shrapnel. This is a terrorist entity that abuses everything it gets his hand on. And I, I, I blame the Israelis to an extent, but let's be clear that the number one reason that Gazans are right now not getting the aid that they need is because the Israelis cannot trust Hamas not yep. to turn meal packages into weapons of war. I, OK, I completely accept all of that. Nevertheless, Palestinian civilians are dying. Um, and, and I'm very happy for Israel to continue the war. Um, and to, I, I think it's absurd for people to say they've got, Israel's got a right for self-defence and then say, oh, oh, but, you know, you can't go into Rafah where the remaining Hamas terrorists are and in belief, leave some 134 hostages 
ones that we think might still be alive. Um, but I'm not entirely sure, you know, how, how we resolve this. But it seems to me to be very clear that humanitarian aid has got to be delivered. Uh, we need to have independent journalists on the ground as well. That's a, that's a very big issue, I think, of such as there are independent journalists remaining on this issue, because we know half the journalists certainly working in Gaza are actually, you know, affiliated to Hamas, for goodness sake. A lot of this information we get out, that the BBC very happily puts on its website and on air, uh, is very questionable indeed. Um, I don't know where this results. We are going to be talking after midday to uh, one of the young survivors of the Nova Festival, the, the, the music festival that was attacked by a uh, Hamas terrorist. Uh, she hid for eight hours whilst uh, uh, her friends were slaughtered. Absolutely extraordinary thing to go through. We're also going to be talking to Douglas Murray. We're going to talk about extremism here. Oh, and what's happening in Gaza. Of course, he's been into Gaza with the IDF uh, in recent months. Um, let's also talk about what's happening back home. We mentioned it with Peter Blexley a little while ago. This extraordinary stat that police have solved no burglaries at all in half of all neighbourhoods in England and Wales. I mean, you, you, do you think that was an exaggeration? No, that's on official figures. They simply don't bother solving burglaries. Um, I think if resources were put into it, they would be able to solve those burglaries. I reckon you could probably get some evidence. I find it extraordinary that burglars are now so clever at hiding their DNA and their fingerprints. There's no... And with all this CCTV we have, people with those, you know, those doorbells which show who's... I mean, really? They can't find a, a single burglar anymore? Have we just basically given up on policing crime in our streets? Well, the police have convinced themselves that they can get away with not... Uh, investigating certain types of crime. And they're broadly right, OK? If they fail to go after somebody on social media or if they get themselves into some politically charged row, the Guardian and editorials are right down their throat and they're going for them. But they have worked out that they can ignore burglary after burglary after burglary after burglary. And all that's said of it, and it's a really important story, but in some ways it's grossly insufficient, is the statistics at the end of it saying they're not investigating it. Each one of those statistics is a home violated, yeah. is a life ruined in many cases, is property stolen. And sure, in many cases, the insurance will pay it back. But, but your sense that. of home will never be the same again after people have been rummaging through it. Absolutely. I think I know so many people that's happened to as well. Thank you very much indeed. Well, let's come back to your messages about Rishi Snack vowing to tackle extremism on British streets. What's your reaction? Give us a call 0344 499 text 8722. Get in touch on uh, X at Talk TV. Kayla says, it's only because his cohorts are now having to put up with what the public has to put up with. Very good point. Yeah, when it's attacks on MPs, that's different, right? Wendy says, it's very one-sided. This is more about stopping free speech and peaceful protest. And Chris says, better late than never, although it's probably too late already. I do wonder certainly about the new definition of extremism, which frankly, I mean, could include an awful lot of people who have very reasonable views. Uh, you've also been getting in touch on the phones. Keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Simon, who's in Winchester. Hello, Simon. Good morning to Good you. Good morning to you. You sound very uh, chirpy on this sunny Monday well, morning. I have a wonderful time listening to you. Well, thank you. I, I follow a lot of things you say. The only thing is, you think so quickly, I can barely keep up. Sorry. I get told <laughs> off about that all the time. I, it's too much to say, Simon. Right, what do you want to say about what Rishi Sunak said outside right, Downing Street? Well, what this whole issue of Rishi Sunak's uh, speech has triggered off with me, me has tri triggered off with me, is... The whole question, what do we mean by democracy? And can I just ask you a question? Did you ever listen to the Reef Lectures? Yes. Uh, Professor Ben Ansell? No, oh no, I haven't heard. Oh, well, I'll look them up. Because he did four very fine speeches on d democracy, uh, the weaknesses of democracy, security, and the future of democracy. And I refer to him, I find it helpful for me to have what I call an academic structure yeah. of what we mean by democracy. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to give you a lecture. No, no. <laughs> but it's <laughs> not just us going to vote every four or five years. Do you think, do you think that the Prime Minister, I have to bring it back to that, do you, think, do you think the Prime Minister is actually going to tackle extremism? Do you think our democracy is under threat? I think what I'm getting at here, and this is the, I'm not a politician, the academic, I'm trying to get across a, a, a kind of mental attitude in politicians, the media, and things. We, democracy is something, it's a, it's a structure that needs to be protected. Yeah. Now, no person, I mean, the Prime Minister, I think, made a good start, but it, it takes 
a lot more than one person yeah. to shift a lot of thinking into what is... No, I would, I would absolutely agree with you on that. I'm going to have to leave it there because I've, I've, I'm going to have to go to a break. But I, I, I do agree with you. And again, I, my view is certainly free speech, democracy, these things were fought for, people died for them. They don't just exist in a vacuum. They have to be fought for every, you know, every generation again and again and again. We should never take them for granted. Simon, thank you very much. I'm going to look up those lectures. I, I know they're always uh, available online. Now, uh, coming up after the break, the new MP for Rochdale, one George Galloway, will be sworn into Parliament today. This after Rishi Sunak targeted both Islamist and far-right extremists. We'll talk about that, plus the budget with Sir Ian Duncan-Smith up next. Don't forget, Douglas Murray coming up in the next hour as well. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, the new MP for Rochdale, one George Galloway, is to be sworn into Parliament today. This after Rishi Sunak on Friday targeted both Islamist and far right extremists, saying democracy is under threat. Well, joining me now to discuss this and pledge more is former Conservative Party leader Sir Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, good morning to you, Sir Ian. Morning, Julia. Morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, is democracy under threat? Well, democracy is always under threat, although I do think democracy right now is under threat globally and internally. Globally, because we have a growing, what I call the axis of authoritarian states, China, North Korea, Russia, Iran, Syria has now joined that group and others in the Middle East moving towards a much closer coalition uh, with China, who themselves don't have elected governments. So permanently their task and China's determination is to get rid of democracy. They don't believe democracy is the right form of government. They believe their authoritarian government is the same. So with that goes 
uh, getting rid of uh, well, same, the rule same of law Russia, and of human rights. Most of the Middle East as well. I mean, there's, there's certainly yeah, that case. Yeah. In terms of this country, though, the Prime Minister talked mm -hmm. about extremism in this country. He specifically mentioned not just Islamist extremists. He says Islamist extremists and far right groups are spreading a poison. That poison is extremism. A bit of a tautology there. Um, but it may aims to drain us of our confidence in ourselves as a people and in our shared future. After 14 years of Conservative Party rule, why is our confidence in ourselves and our shared future being drained? Isn't that down to a total abject lack of action to tackle this extremism? Well, there's no question there is extremism in existence. Of course, it's a minority position. The majority of those who live in this country want to get on with their lives. So this is about a minority, but who have a disproportionate effect. So we have terrorism, which we know exists. And in fact, I think... Uh, probably at least three quarters, if not 80% of those terrorists under watch now uh, are, are Islamicists, in other words, extreme people who claim uh, links to Islam, but at the same time are terrorists trying to find their way. So, But there are others as well. There's been others, the IRA, there's others as well that threaten and make poisonous uh, death threats. I've had a number of death threats uh, from various groups. I can never figure out who they are, but... Uh, basically, that does exist at the moment. Is it worse than it has been before? Yes, I think recently the Gaza, uh, uh, awful Gaza saga has, and the murder of the Jewish people in, who were peacefully um, partying, etc., that's had a shockwave effect around the world. You can see it marches endlessly, all of that stuff. And it's the stuff that goes on in the marches, which again is, <clears throat> is not the majority, but a minority do re repeat these ridiculous slogans that are very dangerous and threatening uh, to Jewish people. Many come to march simply for the to stop the killing and the death and the war, which is quite legitimate, but there are others embed themselves into these things and use an opportunity to try and turn opinions uh, into a very but aggressive... The Prime um, but the Prime Minister, in, in that, uh, that address outside uh, Dumber 10 Downing Street, he was talking about how, you know, uh, people shouldn't allow, on those marches, shouldn't allow their marches to be hijacked by extremists. Those marches are organised by groups, most of which have links to the Hamas terrorist leadership. But they're organised by those people. It's not They've not been hijacked by them. They, they are using the people who are genuinely and quite rightly concerned about uh, the Palestinian civilians uh, under attack. Uh, uh, you know, but, but, you know, you don't see people on those marches calling for, you know, down with Hamas. Anyone who goes on those marches and has an anti-Hamas uh, a placard or, 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 or anything like that, uh, they have to be surrounded by police to protect them. I mean, it doesn't sound like a minority to me anymore. Well, they are a minority, but <clears throat> they're a minority that get their voice heard. The point I'd make very simply, I don't disagree with you, is that, you know, how many of the people who cry foul over what's going on in Gaza have ever bothered to cry foul over the genocide of the Uyghur yep. under China or the yep. persecution of the Christians in China or the uh, inner Mongolians in China or the crackdown in Hong Kong or the terrible war now in Ukraine, which has cost many, many more lives and where they're targeting deliberately uh, civilian well, well, places. That leads us right nicely now. into uh, George no. Galloway, the new MP for, well... Is it Rochdale? Is it Gaza? It's difficult to tell. He mentioned Gaza uh, in his acceptance speech in the early hours of Friday morning. Um, he ran on a very divisive uh, campaign ticket, but completely different leaflets to Muslim areas mm -hmm. and white areas of the city, uh, making it very clear what his priorities were. Um, but, um, you know, he's someone who has praised Saddam Hussein, a man who killed millions of, of Muslims in the Iran-Iraq war, um, you know, an invasion of Kuwait. Like, he, he, he has happily praised um, Bashar al-Assad, who, who massacred millions of his own people and forced them in, many into exile in Syria. Um, very, very unhappy about what's happening in Gaza, though, probably because it's happening to them as a result of actions by Israel. It doesn't seem to have that much of an issue with Hamas. He's certainly, certainly been very friendly with Hezbollah uh, in his time. Um, does his election as MP for Rochdale, his swearing in in Parliament today, is that, is that a game changer? Is that a wake up call to the political class or is it a danger to our democracy? Well, I've known George Galloway for years and uh, uh, he tends to alight on areas where he can create the greatest division, feed off that division uh, and either get elected or to get heard. Etc. One thing that I always keep saying to people, where was 
George Galloway and others, when uh, Iran continues to execute thousands of uh, peaceful uh, democracy campaigners in Iran. Uh, the government could do a lot more right now to kind of snuff out some of this stuff. For example, we have the Iranian Republican Guard is not uh, prescribed yet by the UK. There are two Iranian banks that exist here in London. These are also helping finance surreptitiously lots of what's going on in terms of the Gaza thing. And they are the supporters of Hamas without, <clears throat> without Iran. Hamas wouldn't have done what they've done. Uh, Hezbollah wouldn't move. Uh, what's going on down amongst the Houthi on the Red Sea, where they deliberately target and threaten uh, shipping, which is going to put the cost of a few food and fuel up again because they can't go on the shorter route. That's all organized by Iran. And yet the UK government still hasn't prescribed the Iranian uh, Re uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps who are right behind all of this stuff. America's done it, asked us to, to, to prescribe them, and some other countries have done it too, but the yeah. UK should do. And I think but there are actions we could take to basically start trying to shut off uh, the nonsense that Iran gets up to. Yeah, well, Why I mean, we apparently we're going to stop letting groups. hate preachers into the country, which is something I thought we'd done many, many well, years ago. Well, I couldn't ago. agree with you more. Well, I mean, what, what, about, what about, I mean, George Galloway, you yeah. mentioned too, you know, Iran and Russia, he's happily taken payments in, to the tune of thousands, many thousands of pounds as a, as a host of TV shows on both Russian and Iran-backed uh, television, Give, given that both of those countries are not democracies in any meaningful sense, uh, where people are hounded for, you know, journalists in particular and politicians, uh, basically murdered uh, or imprisoned and tortured uh, for their views. What do you think about a man like that being in the House of Commons, taking their money? Well, I mean, I've been asked to go uh, on uh, RT uh, a number of times, and I always make it very clear that no one in this country should be working for RT. Well, I, I agree. I find his views reprehensible, but, uh, you know, he's been elected. And the one thing, to yep. democracy, whether you like the result or not, he has been elected uh, to represent uh, the people, and therefore he's got to come and speak, unless, of course, he starts talking up the idea of attacks, terrorism, uh, and the killings. I mean, the truth is, the UK government, following Rishi Sunak's speech, could act now. What we need to do is cut off the resources available to all of these uh, very hardline extremists who want to destroy the way we live our lives and all our freedoms. It's quite ironic quite a lot of the time that those often that march don't realise that some of the money behind a lot of what's going on hugely in Gaza, etc., is uh, an organisation that is busy killing thousands Absolutely. on thousands Can I of ask own you, people in Iran. Just finally, and very briefly, if you would, because, look, we haven't got the budget yet, we don't know, there's not much point discussing too no. much about it until we've mm -hmm. actually heard what Jeremy Hunt has to say on Wednesday. But talk about whether there be a national insurance cut, an income tax cut, a 1p or 2p, who knows whether it's more, they're just playing down mm -hmm. expectations. Do you genuinely think there is anyone in this country who has now had enough of the Conservatives after 14 years who will say, oh, well, in that case... 2p cut in my income tax or national insurance, I'll vote Tory again. Well, it's, it depends on what you see as uh, tax. If you think tax is just a short-term bribe, then it won't change any opinions. If you see what really this is all about, which is to get the economy growing, people like me think that the economy is now over-tightened with the highest tax rates and with high interest rates. We think the Bank of England is guilty of raising interest rates uh, too late and is now playing catch-up and is going to reduce them too late. So the economy's problem is it's not growing as it should do because the costs of running business, the costs okay. of people's income, if you're in middle incomes, you're sliding across into higher rate tax bans. That is an invidious, really, and should be stopped. And so I have only one message to the Chancellor. You need to get growth. This economy is very strong underneath, but it needs growth, and that requires reducing the burdens of regulation, tax, and getting the bank to bring the interest rates okay. down so we can start getting the economy moving. I have a huge faith in British enterprise and people's ability to work, but what you can't do is expect them to do all of this if it's not worthwhile at the end of the day because their taxes are too high and interest rates Sorry, are too Duncan high. Smith, thank you very much indeed, former Conservative Party leader, appreciate that. Um, so come, uh, so, <laughs>
get it right, commentator, sorry, Sam Armstrong is still with me. Leaving aside the, the tax side of things for now, uh, but in terms of what he had to say, in terms of what we need to do to tackle extremism, what, what do you have to say about what Ian Duncan Smith said? Well, Ian Duncan Smith just named two or three other actions that the government could take, including prescribing the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Yeah. Perfectly good policy, something that would work, have a tangible effect. The Prime Minister has done and is going to do None of those things. They are going to rehash some words from the past. They're going to re-announce policies. Yeah. And they are not, at the moment, prepared to take the really tough actions that we need to see to deal with these problems. Yeah. I wonder if Ian Duncan Smith was still the leader of the Conservative Party as opposed to Rishi Sunak, whether, he whether would that be would be... That. Doing I, to be I think he bolder. does understand these things rather more clearly, I think, certainly saying that. All right, uh, well, let's talk about what your thoughts are on this. What's your reaction to Rishi Sunak vowing to tackle extremism on British streets? Call 0344 499 1000, text 87222 or get in touch at Talk TV. Chris has done that. He says, too little, too late. Only bothered when it affected them. Now they want security for a threat they denied existed. Exactly. Jeff says, talk is cheap, don't listen to what they say, see what they do. And Jay says, a bit like shutting the gate when the horse has already bolted. Uh, you've also been getting in touch on the phone. So let's go to Chris, who's in Surrey. Hello, Chris. Morning, Julia. Good morning, Sam. Morning. I've really enjoyed listening to the programme. Great stuff. For the most Thank part this morning. Well, what do you um, want to say? Uh, what you, what's your reaction to what Rishi said? Well, what Rishi said was just words. I mean, have you ever heard a speech that was less impassioned and had less backbone. That's true. Because I haven't. No. I, I, I mean, I was despairing when I, when I watched it. Absolutely despairing. I, I was. I mean, I, and the funny thing is, you just had IDS on. Um, I don't know who he upset in the party, but he, he would make a much better leader than Sunak. <laughs> and the, the, the problem is, it, it, they're taking us for fools. The, the other Chris that texted into you is right. They're now starting to take the uh, view of security seriously because they're under threat. Yeah. Whereas I had a beautiful penthouse flat on the commercial road in Tower Hamlet in one of the new developments. Yeah. And I used to have to go and meet. I had uh, a whole mix of friends. And when girls came, I would have to walk down to Limehouse Link to walk them back to the apartment. And this was 15 years ago because they would be spat on and shouted at, it's not attacked. And that was 15 years ago. I moved out, I moved out of the area, I'm back in Surrey now. Right, interesting. Uh, so it, you're, 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 you're saying, like, basically, a lot of people are saying MPs, Prime Minister, only care because it's happening to them, and actually people who've been warning about all this for a long time have all been told, shut up, you're saying the wrong thing. But, oh, what a surprise we weren't. Chris, I really appreciate your call. Thank you so much. Keep on listening and watching. Coming up after the break, Buckingham Palace has criticised the madness of social media after conspiracy theories abound about the absence of the Princess of Wales. Plus, latest difficulties for one and only Prince Andrew. I'm Julia hartley Brew. and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Britt, and you are with Talk TV. Let's uh, talk royal news now. And Buckingham Palace has criticised the madness of social media as conspiracy theories have abounded about the Princess of Wales's health online after she underwent abdominal surgery more than six weeks ago. She hasn't been seen since. Also, Prince Andrew is fearing being back in the news. Joining me now to discuss this is editor of Majesty magazine and author of the new uh, biography of uh, King Charles and the late Queen, my mother and I, Ingrid Seward. Thank you so much for joining us, Ingrid. Thank you. Um, let's talk, first of all, about Prince Andrew, because the front page of Sunday Mirror yesterday is saying that Prince Andrew faces a fresh court bombshell. And this is new questions over his support for this paedophile friend, Jeffrey Epstein, uh, with the release of shock, well, shocking release of court papers. Uh, these are court papers which will, by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signing a bill allowing this grand jury testimony, going all the way back to the 2006 probe into sex trafficking by Jeffrey Epstein. He was able to do an incredibly sweetheart deal. There were some 40 women and girls who came forward saying they'd been sex trafficked by him and used by him. Um, and, and yet it was able to be, bar you know, lobbied down and plead, plead bargain down to just sort of one case. He ended up serving, we got a two-year sentence, ended up serving only less than a year behind bars. Most of that, he was on day release anyway. Um, and it's understood that Prince Andrew basically gave a testimony on his behalf and urged the authorities to give him that plea deal carried on staying friends with him afterwards. If that testimony comes out, that's the end of Prince Andrew, isn't it? I do totally agree with you, Julia. I think that it would be so damaging if it was revealed, if, if, because we don't know yet, that, that uh, the Duke of York, Prince Andrew, whatever you would like to call him, had pleaded on Geoffrey Epstein's behalf um, and actually helped prevent him having a stiffer sentence. Um, I'm sure that Epstein got, got all his powerful friends to lobby on his behalf. And we, we don't know if Andrew is involved or not. We, we do know that Andrew saw him afterwards, yeah. after he'd been released. Stayed at his from, house. Um, yeah, at, stayed in his house in, in New York, which is where those uh, rather incriminating photographs were taken of him sort of peeking around the door. But this is so damaging, and especially for young pe younger people who may not, you know, know much about Prince Andrew and may not know that he was once, you know, a hero. He, he was a hero of the Falklands War. Yeah. Um, they won't know any of that, and they just see him... Uh, you know, they just see him for well, what they read he's, about Well, he's, him he's a man who's friends with paedophiles and, and, and pays millions of pounds to a woman he claims never to have met, who claims she raped him. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, but, you know, that, that's all people are going to know about him. We know we've got that new film version of the interview he did on Newsnet with Emmy Maitlis coming out as well very soon. But it's also bearing in mind that part of that plea bargain, that plea deal, was an extraordinary agreement that none of his associates would ever be facing uh, any criminal charges. Of course, one of those associates was Prince Andrew. We shall see what happens there. If that does happen in the coming days, I mean, that is going to explode everywhere. Um, 
that will, I suppose, at least do away with some of the conspiracy theories, the wild theories uh, all over the internet. Social media will wash them. We're not going to speak about it. I don't want to pander to any of those conspiracy theories about uh, Princess of Wales, Kate. We know she's had abdominal surgery. We know when she had it, where she had it. She's not been seen since then, some six weeks plus ago. Been various absences of other royals as well, including her husband from his own godfather's memorial service. Big concerns about the state of her health. But is the palace wrong to, to not give more information, feeding those conspiracy theorists? Or do they have a right, as I'm sure you and I agree, they have a right to privacy about their health? Well, I think I, th I think that Kate has a right to privacy about her health. I don't think any woman w would necessarily want to publicise, uh, you know, some health problems that she's had. Anything to do with her abdominal surgery is very, very private. And I think that the trouble was what happened on social media was, was when uh, the Prince of Wales, William, sort of backed out of his godfather, King Constancy's memorial service, with sort of 45 minutes before the service was due to start. That's what started all of this off. Because yeah. they thought, well, you know, maybe something's wrong with Kate. Why don't we know? Why haven't we seen her? And the palace said, but look, we said you wouldn't see her, you know, until probably after Easter. And they've always said that. Mm. But it doesn't stop these rumours happening, I think that really there's not very much you can do about them except um, ignore them because there's going to be rumours whatever yeah. happens. I mean, exactly. If there she, are rumours when she's in the news every day. The thing is, we did get used to the point, and I was always take the mic when I was doing newspaper reviews, you know, that it's virtually the law now. There has to be a picture of Kate in a new outfit on the front page of virtually every newspaper every single day. They were very ubiquitous. But now the royal family has gone down to this much more slimmed down royal family without all the sort of the random extras who, you know, were living in Kensington Palace for years. And it's just gone, you know, no Prince Harry and Duchess of Sussex and no Prince Andrew. That actually, there aren't many to go round. And while the King's being treated for cancer and Kate out of action, Prince of Wales out of action for quite some time while looking after her and the children early on uh, in her recovery. You know, there aren't many to go round and this leaves something of a vacuum. And as we know, these vacuums have a habit of getting filled with chitter chatter. Well, absolutely. But this is this was King Charles's, uh, his ultimate aim was always to have a slim down monarchy. He felt there were too many royals uh, doing too many things uh, and being a burden to the taxpayer. So he thought he would he would definitely slim it down. And he said this years ago. Mm. And I think he's right. And I think that we don't need to see, well, although it'd be lovely for all of uh, people like me, but other people don't need to see uh, various royals doing so many things. I think keeping it to the core of the family is a very good idea. But of course, then when one or two of them drop out, it is much more noticeable. But... Um, they, they've been fairly open with us, the palace, much more open than they used to be, that's that's certain. Yeah, the trouble is, of course, it's never open enough for some people, is it? Claims, no, well, you know, well about... once you start being open, then people want more and more, obviously. That's, yeah. that's human nature. Yeah, absolutely. We shall see what happens in the coming weeks. Thank you very much, Ingrid Seward, editor of Majesty magazine, author of My Mother and I, about Prince... Uh, sorry, King Charles. Still, you, you can't... You've had 50 years of saying that, haven't you? Um, Sam Armstrong, still in the studio, just a brief word. I mean, conspiracy theories, I don't want to go into any of them because I don't want to fuel them at all. It's understandable, but should the palace be more open or should they have just not told us anything at all? Well, look, I feel very sorry for Kate, not least because we've also had the news this morning that her uncle is on his way to Celebrity yeah. Big Brother. Stay classy. Apparently got a right old ear bashing from her mum. Quite right, too. Yeah. I, I have a real problem with You're a nobody other than you're yes. related to her. Why? Why do that to your niece? Yeah, she's recovering in hospital from or at home from a really, whatever it is, is, is clearly a major surgery. And this is really the last thing they need. I just, these people everywhere. As I you know. know. Every family's got one. Well, exactly. We know Duchess of Sussex has got one. Exactly, as well. Thank you very much indeed. I very much uh, appreciate that. Uh, coming up after the break, we're going to be talking to a survivor of the Nova Music Festival massacre on October the 7th. We're also going to be joined live uh, by Douglas Murray. Plenty more coming up, lots more to talk about. Um, but, uh, we've got uh, obviously more, of course, from Sam Armstrong as well. Uh, this is Talk TV. I'm Julia Hartley-Brew. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. 
you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brew, and you are with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, the new MP for Rochdale, George Galloway, is to be sworn into Parliament today. This after Rishi Sunak targeted both Islamist and far-right far -right extremists, uh, saying democracy is under threat. We'll talk to Douglas Murray about all of that coming up. US Vice President Kamala Harris has called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza in order to get hostages out. And in a moment, I'll be talking to a survivor of the Nova Music Festival massacre on October the 7th, who hid for eight hours as her friends were shot dead by Hamas terrorists. Uh, plus, we'll look ahead to what the US, US Supreme Court is set to rule today on whether to uphold Colorado's bid to ban Donald Trump from running for president ahead of Super Tuesday tomorrow. All that coming up. First, let's get the latest news headlines with Natalia Horkera. Good afternoon. Ministers are set to broaden the government's definition of extremism as part of a crackdown on protesters. The Times reported that Rishi Sunak is consulting with ministers to update the definition, which the government says is no longer being fit for purpose. A new definition, which is still being finalised, is expected to cover those whose actions more broadly undermine the country's values. It comes after George Galloway was criticised by the Prime Minister after his surprising win in the Rochdale by-election. The new MP is set to be sworn in later today, but has received pushback from Sunak, who has 
has described his win as beyond alarming for British democracy. Peter Ford, the deputy leader of the Workers' Party of Britain, told Talk TV the attack on his MP was Sunak's way of trying to scare the public. There was no extremism on display. And what Sunak is doing is trying to whip up hysteria in the hope of rescuing Tory fortunes. It's politicizing of the situation with the Muslim community is quite shameful and dangerous. As the government prepares to unveil its last spring budget before a general election, the Chancellor has again hinted he could be on the verge of introducing more tax cuts. Jeremy Hunt and the Prime Minister have been in last-minute talks over the weekend as they face significant pressure from Tory backbenchers to win back voters. Meanwhile, Jeremy Hunt and his team are facing further pressure from the motoring industry to use the budget to help jumpstart electric vehicle sales in the UK. Former Top Gear presenter and motoring Analyst Quinton Wilson says it's an outdated fee that makes no sense. For the 38% of people who don't have driveways in this country, it's a barrier to adoption and it's slowing down the take up of electric cars. The VAT laws on this were written in the early 90s before electric cars were even a, a twinkle in Elon Musk's eyes. The media watchdog Ofcom has ruled that Lawrence Fox's misogynistic comments about female journalist Ava Evans on GB News broke broadcasting rules. The actor turned political activist made the remarks on Dan Wooten's show, which prompted nearly 9,000 complaints, the most complained about TV event last year. Ofcom said Fox's comments were degrading and demeaning both to Miss Evans and women generally. Fox has since been sacked by the channel. A state of emergency has been declared in Haiti after armed gangs released more than 4,000 criminals who are being held in the capital's main prison. The men stormed the compound in Port-au-Prince last night and allowed everyone who was being held there to walk free. The country has seen violence worsen in recent years as gangs aim to oust the Prime Minister. And the RNLI is celebrating saving more than 146,000 lives as it marks its 200th anniversary. A service of Thanksgiving is being held today at Westminster Abbey with representatives from the charity from across the UK and Ireland attending. Talk TV correspondent Nork Ellaby, Nick Ellaby is at one of the newest and busiest RNLI stations in Chiswick, West London. And also recently we've had the RNLI dragged into the culture wars as well with politicians like Nigel Farage calling it a glorified taxi service for illegal migrants, picking them up in the channel. Well, only 3% of RNLI call-outs are to do with those small boats. And as you mentioned, 238 stations all around the country, mostly on beaches. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, lots of sun out there today, but rain for some areas. We can see in the earlier radar picture, there's lots of rain piling into the southwest of the UK, as well as across the far northeast over Shetland and Orkney. It's a cloudy, damp picture there. The rain across the southwest will be steadily moving its way northeastwards for this afternoon across Ireland, Wales, the West Country, towards the West Midlands and central southern England later. Everywhere else, mostly fine and bright, perhaps a bit cloudier for eastern England, though. Lots of sunshine and dry weather for mainland. Scotland and Northern England. Later that rain reaches Northern Ireland into this evening and overnight it continues its journey further north and eastwards, eventually over towards the northeast of Scotland and the eastern seaboard of England, turning mostly light and patchy in nature as it does. Further south and west it becomes clear and cold, a chilly night but not as cold as the previous one, but I think we'll still see a frost for many areas as well as areas of mist and fog that will be quite slow to clear through tomorrow. Now tomorrow much uh, of the UK will see sunshine once again but there will be rain across Ireland then Northern Ireland into western parts of Britain later on, mainly showers. And the far northeast of Scotland will also see some spells of rain, but mainly dry and bright elsewhere. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather.
Good afternoon. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brew, and you are with Talk TV. Still with me in the studio is commentator Sam Armstrong. And uh, today we've been asking you about what Rishi Sunak had to say on Friday. He's vowed to tackle extremism on British streets. I want to know what your reaction is, particularly when he mentioned far-right extremism in the same breath as Islamist extremism. Give us a call on 0344 499 text 8722. We'll get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. It has to be said, uh, you have not uh, been uh, speaking very warmly about what he had to say. Uh, this, of course, on the day that George Galloway is going to be sworn in as a new MP for Rochdale. Or is it Gaza? It's really difficult to tell, isn't it? Moving on, though, uh, US Vice President Kamala Harris has called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza for at least the next six weeks in order to get hostages out and called on Israel to allow more humanitarian aid in to help starving civilians. We're going to be talking to Douglas Murray about all of that coming up. First up, though, I don't think we should forget about how this all started. And no, it wasn't 75 years ago or 15 years ago or four years ago. It was just a matter of a few months ago on October the 7th. I'm joined now by one of the survivors of the October 7th massacre at the Nova Music Festival. That's Noah Kalash. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for um, having me. My my first impression when you walked into the studio while the news was on was how young you are. You're just 23 years old. You're just a few years older than my own daughter. And you have had the most awful, harrowing, horrific experience, the sort of experience that parents spend their whole lives trying to make sure their children never have to go through. And you seem so together, terrifyingly so, given what you've gone through. Um, you are here in the UK to help publicise uh, a, a documentary, a, a very short 15-minute documentary called Nova, the name of the music festival you were at on October the 7th. Um, involves raw material, footage shot by people at the festival. You were one of those there. We have some footage that you yourself shot. Unfortunately, it's not of you dancing and having fun with your friends. It's you cowering underneath a bush desperately trying to stay alive, which thankfully you did, but your, many of your friends did not. Tell us in your own words, first-hand testimony, what happened on that day? That day was uh, supposed to be all about freedom, music, nature, and good people, beautiful people celebrating their lives, and turned out to be the biggest nightmare possible. You were dancing, having fun with a bunch of friends. It's a music festival, it builds off the peace festival as well. It's a peace. What was the first sign that anything was wrong? Rockets being shot above us. I looked at the sky. Not unusual, though, in that part of Israel. It happens. This is uh, the, the area of the Gaza Strip, so as funny as it sounds, it's like how our reality, so... It happens. And so did you go to take cover? Or did you go to flee at that point? Um, they shut down the party and they just told us to that the finish, they finished the party and we have to go back home. And um, I decided to stop at the side of the road in a bomb shelter until things will come down a little bit. And uh, it didn't happen. So we eventually decided to continue driving home. Mm -hmm. And that's when we first saw the terrorist. And were they driving to you? Did you see the paragliders, the people who came in from the air? Yeah, we saw everything. It was a big mess. But um, uh, the first encounter I had with a terrorist were uh, when they started shooting at, at the, at, on the cars. So you were in a convoy of people leaving the festival. Yeah. And suddenly there were a convoy of terrorists shooting at you. Yeah, exactly. And then you realised immediately what no. was happening? What did no. you think was happening? I thought maybe it's a few terrorists who run away from the Gaza Strip because that's also usual in this side of the country. We didn't understand the size of the attack. That we it had was no thousands idea. Of we had no idea. Thousands. Okay. So you're in a car with friends? With my friend, yeah. Just one friend? Yeah. Um, a guy? Mm hmm. Yeah. What did you do? The minute we met them, I had to spin my car because they were shooting at all the cars. And uh, we, I was driving back to the rave area and they started to close at us from every direction possible until we got stuck in a huge traffic of thousands of cars trying to escape the party. That's when um, 
the security and police told us just run away, run for your life. You're not going to be able to get out through yeah. your vehicle, so just physically run. Physically run. So you got out of your cars. Um, was it mayhem? I mean, presumably you got the shooting, you got the noise of that, people screaming. Can you? Could you? Did you see people? who were already shot, who were already I dead. saw people falling down, running and just falling on the way. We lost, like, while running, we lost people on the way. And where did you run to? Where do you to run to? To the open to? field. Yeah. Like, everywhere, looking for a place to hide, a bush or a tree or anything we could see, until they started, we, we started hearing uh, guns from another place, from the place we are running towards. So we had to change direction again. And then we got into an open field where we didn't have any place to hide. So my friend took my hand and uh, we got into the first bush we saw. He had to break the branches and to push me inside. And we were in that bush for eight hours. And we've got a picture of you right now, a video you, you filmed of yourself just lying on the ground as still as possible, silent, just hoping not to be found, hoping against hope. Eight hours you lay in the bush. That's how long did the shooting around you go on? For that whole time? That or? whole time. We didn't have five seconds of silence. And you must have been aware, although probably unable to see out properly without risking your life, that those shots were not being fired into the air. They were being shot into fellow human beings. Yeah. And you could hear people screaming, crying? It was... Uh, we were... Just us, me and my friend, alone, with another girl who was hiding in the bush near us. And uh, they took her because we could hear them walking outside our bush. It was very thick, so they couldn't see us. And we couldn't see clearly outside, but we could hear everything. And um, But you were aware of another girl yeah. who was in a nearby, but you could see her? No, we can only you, hear you'd her. You'd heard her? Yeah. And then you, you became aware of her when they found, the, the Hamas terrorists found her. What did they do with her? They said, don't worry, we're not going to hurt you. Come with us, drink some water. And she said, no, don't touch me, I'm scared. And the minute after, silent. What were you feeling at this time? What were you, what were you thinking? I was just thinking about living another second. You were literally... You're not thinking about tomorrow. No, You're not thinking no. about the next hour. It's You're impossible thinking... to think about tomorrow. What what goes through your head when Hamas terrorists are outside, or like a, a meter or two away from a bush that you are hiding in? When Closing you know... my eyes. Yeah. Not stopping my 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 breath, just so they won't hear us, hugging each other. That's it. You survived. Did your friends survive? My friend who was with me in the bush survived, but many of my bestest friends are not with us, and one of them is uh, held hostage in Gaza. Their name? Romy Gunen. How old? She's 23 years old. She's my age. We used to travel together for six months. She's... You know each other inside out. Yeah. yeah. One of the biggest concerns now about the hostages being held in Gaza by Hamas, concerns that many may be dead possibly up to a 30 or more of the 134 believed still be being held. Um, Hamas won't confirm. This is one of the reasons why some of the ceasefire talks uh, uh, are not moving ahead. Um, but there's also concern about how they're being treated, not just lack of food, medicine, medical care, but also given the testimonies we have had and the, 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 from those who saw and witnessed horrific rape, gang rape, mutilation, torture of people, um, particularly the gang rape of women, um, other people who were hiding who witnessed, physically witnessed it, but the concern that what is, about what is happening in the Hamas tunnels. It's a horrible thing to talk about, particularly when it's someone you're here in front of me. What, what are your fears? What are her family's fears? It's impossible to even think about a young girl just like me, a good friend of mine, such as many others that are still... Held Living a completely there. normal life a few months yeah. ago. Like beautiful young girls. Um, I can't even imagine what they're going through. It's, it's hard to, to even think about what's happening there right now, especially to, to the girls because of the sexual assault and, and all the testimonies we're mm -hmm. starting to hear. I'm just hoping 
that they're okay somehow. And that they, she gets out along with many others. Um, Amen. A lot of people online particularly, but certainly, uh, I mean, in the millions, seem to believe various conspiracy theories about what happened. Now, you're not a political person, you've told me before we started the interview. Um, but, you know, did this happen? You know, did Israel bring it on themselves? Did they know it was going to happen? Did they want an excuse to go into Gaza? Are these testimonies real? Were women really raped? Were they, you know, were, were there so many people killed? Um, why are you choosing to speak out? Why are you choosing to tell your, your story about what happened to you? Why is that important to you? You know, it happened in a music festival in Israel, but it could have happened in a, another international other music festival. It could be here, it could be in New York or any other big city. And people need to put their, themselves in our shoes for a minute because all I did was going out to party and enjoy with my good friends. And I couldn't imagine that this is how things are going to end, that they're going to take my friend. And it's, it's already been 150 days. They're held in Gaza. Yeah. It's impossible it's to even lifetime. think about it. So yeah. I'm here to say the truth. I'm here to say, bring them back. Bring them back now, all of them. Are you worried that October the 7th is already being forgotten? Are you worried that, for instance, we had people celebrating on the streets of you know, America, Europe, across the Middle East, on the day of this massacre when it first emerged, celebrating what had happened and denying a lot of what had happened. We have journalists here in the UK, you know who you are, who, who believe the testimony of any Hollywood actress who says this is some, some Hollywood director slapped my bum, but doesn't, don't believe the testimony of women who witnessed their friends, their loved ones being raped and tortured and mutilated. Do you, well, how do you deal with that as someone who's been there? Since October 7th, um, explaining and telling my story and, and telling the world what's happened has become my life mission because people don't believe us. And the movie that we were talking about is exactly about that. It's about showing the pure truth. That's yeah. what happened without editing anything. Yeah. That's the raw documentaries. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. You can't ha like have not faith in it. Because... Yes, yeah. and, and yet, and yet, interesting. You know, some of the footage that you know that's been shown to journalists in particular, but some online is actually from Hamas fighters themselves, their own body cams, or stuff that they themselves have put out on Telegram of what they did. So I never. I, what I find bizarre is how many people can deny something that even the perpetrators have not just admitted to, have proudly celebrated with their own footage. Um, I'm going to have to ask you about this. I, look, you're not a politician. You're not representing, you know, the, the Israeli government. You're just an ordinary woman who just went to a music festival who's become a victim of this. Um, but a lot of focus right now on what's happening in Gaza, a lot of focus on what's happening to civilians in particular, women and children, women your age, younger than you children, um, who are facing starvation, facing threats from bombs. They didn't ask for this. They're, they're as much victims of this, many of us would argue, as you and your friends and others who, who were victims um, in, of, this, of this horrible, horrible uh, war. Um, should, should there be a ceasefire, even if that doesn't mean all of the hostages ever get out? Or should, is a ceasefire vital to get them out? And what do you feel about humanitarian aid for those people? I believe that we can all see it, that Hamas has zero humanity for anyone. It doesn't matter if... It's about Israelis or Palestinians, their own civilians. And this is a mutual war against Hamas. That's what we need to keep in mind because it's, it's impossible and it's really hard to understand how many lives have been taken since October 7th on both sides. Yeah. And I'm, it hurts me as much as it hurts them. And I would like my friends to come back home and I wish I wouldn't lo have lost so many friends. And I wish we all as a nation, as the, the citizens of the world, wouldn't lost so many lives in Gaza as well. Absolutely. Now, your, your hair is covering it slightly, but you wear that yellow ribbon, which is to bring back the hostages, something we should never forget. Also, you wear, you're wear wearing a dog tag there, a yeah. necklace. What does it say on that? It says, we will dance again. And I honestly believe and wish for the day that we will dance again.
No, Akalash, thank you very much. You're incredibly brave. I am, I am so pleased you're here to tell the tale, and I'm so sorry that uh, so many of your loved ones were, didn't make it. Um, thank you. Thank you for giving your, 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 your first-hand testimony, which is what we clearly need to have of what's actually happened. Thank you. Thank you so do, much. Do stay with us uh, while we talk to Sam Armstrong's commentator, listening to all of this. And you and I have discussed this so many times since it's happened in October last year, and, and it, it, it does still stagger me how many people will either deny or, or justify or, 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 I mean, just, or criticise, you know, what, what happened on, 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 on October the 7th, as if it is the fault of the people or, or, or who were killed or mutilated or taken hostage or raped, or, or, or the fault of the government that was in charge of protecting those people. Some facts, if I might, and you'll have to forgive me for being political here, Noah, but the protests in this country started, don't forget, yep. started within days of the events of October the 7th. They started before the IDF had fired a single yep. bullet. There were people who all they knew was what had happened to Noah and their friends who went on the streets of this country and celebrated, attacked the victims and did much, much worse. And in this country, we have just elected one of those cheerleaders as a member of parliament who will be deciding and voting upon the laws under which we are government. And he was proud of it. He stood up and said, this is for Gaza. We are living in bleak times yeah. when there are victims of grotesque terrorist violence and sexual assault who do not count simply and solely for the reason that they are Jewish. And then the people who endorse, defend and justify those actions, that attitude, are put into the most powerful body we have in this country. It could not be bleaker yeah. or darker. Uh, absolutely. And again, internationally as well, with the UN and UNWA as, as well. And uh, there are I mean, even the UN Women's Agency refusal to condemn what has happened, undoubtedly happened to Israeli women on October the 7th and, and since in those Hamas tunnels. Um, it, is, it, it is extraordinary. Um, how do we deal with that? Because there's no doubt at all we've got, um, you know, even Kamala Harris, the, the, the US Vice President, you know, allowed out of, you know, uh, the, the locked room they keep her in normally so she doesn't speak out in, you know, anyone hear her. But talking about how we need to have that ceasefire, we need to have it immediate. But she said for at least six weeks, but she was calling on Hamas to agree to the terms. Now, we know there's a lot of dispute about, you know, with all the different countries involved in those negotiations over what those terms would be. For me, I find the idea of an exchange of one, Ham one Hamas uh, held hostage for, you know, a uh, hundred um, Palestinian prisoners. I find I find that obscene. I, I really do. Um, and, and we're not even talking about getting all of the hostages out. When the reality is, even you know, needing this, needing the humanitarian aid for the people of Gaza, which undoubtedly they need. The, you know, you, you know, an eight-year-old child who's currently starving to death, who's been moved from their home, in no way, in no way, is a perpetrator of this this evil attack on October the seventh. Is a victim of that. But the key thing here is, it is Hamas who are the enemies of not just Israel and Jews, but the enemies of Palestinian people and of Muslims. It is Hamas that is the enemy for everybody. Hamas is the problem, and anyone who wants to do anything to stop Israel defeating Hamas is not really on the side of the Palestinian people, in my view. And the reality is Hamas's tactics mean whether this war is short or long, that there are going to be civilian casualties, and that is awful. But if the solution to that problem is to allow Hamas to recover, to rebuild, to refine its strengths, such so they can get to the point where they can go out and do again what they did Which before, they said they wanted to do. They are devoted to it. As far as I'm concerned, every one of the dogs, the animals, the beasts that did what they did on October 7th need to be run down, captured and brought to justice. And look, I would like some of them to be tried as well, not just fought in war, to be tried, brought before the courts. They went into a country that is Israel, that has laws, yeah. and they committed crimes of the lowest order. Everybody needs to be on board with whatever it takes to make that happen okay. and make that happen quickly and as peacefully as it possibly can be. Sam Armstrong, thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you also again to uh, Noah Kalash. I really appreciate it. If you just join me, we're going to take some more messages from uh, our audience. Vishy Sanak has vowed to tackle extremism on British streets. I want to know what your reaction is. Give us a call 0344 499 1000. Text on 8722. You can get in touch on X at Talk TV as well. John has done just that. He says, Oh, is there an election coming up? Let's 
let's not forget the Conservatives have been in power for years and changed the face and safety of the UK. Sally says what he means is he is going to put more restrictions on our freedoms of speech. That's a big concern too. And Pam says, I wouldn't trust the British government to run a bath, let alone a country. I have to say, we've not had many positive messages about anything the government has announced in the last few weeks. Uh, you've also been getting in touch on the phones. Please keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Herbie, who is in London. Hello, Herbie. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good, good afternoon. Afternoon. Yeah. Late uh, night for Herbie last <laughs> night. Herbie, what do you want to say about what Rishi Sunak had to say? Uh, well, it's been going on for a long time. I mean, to say religion and politics do not work together at all. You know, it's dividing everybody. You know, whatever your beliefs are is your beliefs. You should be able to appreciate that everybody has a difference of opinion and yeah. you should respect it. I hate to you tell know, you, you in most of the world, religion drives politics. In most of the world. Unfortunately, yes, it does. And we are being, we, we, you know, extremism is taking over very quickly. It's been going on for a long time, but nobody is able to say anything about it because they're too afraid to say anything well, about you it. Well, if you're Home Secretary, you get sacked. If you're a former Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party, you can lose the Tory whip. And then, do you think it was extraordinary that the Prime Minister was saying, I mean, I know it's different language, but basically making the same point that both Swilla Braverman and Lee Anderson had made, who basically yeah. kind of lost their jobs for it. Yeah, well, this is it. You see, how can you say anything? You know, extremism is now breaking out big time. And regardless of what's been going on, you know, the whole world is at the moment on a tinderbox of, of doom and gloom by the yeah. sounds of it, the way things are going. And there's nobody able to control what is happening. You know, extremism is not very nice because yeah. you have a difference of opinion. You know, you're condemned. You can't say this. You can't do yeah. that. You can't have this. You can't have that. For God's sake, what are we going to do? How are we going to break away from these? Uh, yeah, these, I mean, that's these, the concern. How, how do we do that? Herbie, thank you so much for calling, and I appreciate your, a lot of your frustration. A lot of people be with you with that. Coming up after the break, we're going to talk more about the new MP for Rochdale, George Galloway. He's going to be sworn into Parliament today. This after Rishi Sunak targeted both Islamists and far-right extremists, saying democracy is under threat. We're going to be hearing what Douglas Murray thinks about all of that as he joins us live next. You do not want to miss it. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oh, 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 treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, 
have lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to, it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brew and you are with Talk TV. Now, the new MP for Rochdale, George Galloway, is going to be sworn into Parliament today. Or is he the new MP for Gaza? It's so difficult to tell these days. This after Rishi Sunak targeted both Islamist and, for some reason, far-right extremists on Friday, saying that democracy is under threat. This comes as hate preachers will be blocked from entering the UK as the terror threat level, we're told, reaches its highest since 9-11. But I thought hate preachers were already not allowed in the country. Let's talk about all of this and plenty more besides with author and journalist Douglas Murray, who joins me right now. Uh, good afternoon to you, Douglas. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, I mean, you know, we're only talking about Islamist extremism now after the rise of what we're seeing on our streets. Oh, God, sorry. oh don't forget also far-right extremism, because Rishi seems just as concerned about that, does he not? Even though I've not really seen that being a particular issue on our streets every other Saturday or indeed with, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, what is going on in terms of threats to Parliament. But there we are. Uh, no, that's, uh, that's up to him. Um, but this all comes, of course, after... Uh, Ga George Galloway was elected as the new MP for Rochdale, but then immediately said this was for Gaza. All goes back to what my last guest went through, Noah, uh, at, uh, on October the 7th. Um, how did we get here, Douglas? Well, it's, it's several things, uh, Julia, as you know. I mean, the, the first is obviously, and in the case of a, of a parliamentary seat like Rochdale, uh, it's a result of um, mass migration for many years and a total failure uh, to integrate populations. As I've said repeatedly uh, for a very long time now, if you import the world's people, you also import the world's problems. And, you know, there's a reason why it wasn't just Galloway, but uh, um, the, the, the Labour candidate uh, um, for Rochdale, who of course had to, had to pull out or was, was dumped eventually by the Labour Party for making anti-Semitic comments. Uh, it, it's no coincidence. Uh, it, it, it isn't a coincidence that there was a sort of cluster of people who pander to the certain bigotries in that seat. It's that that's what a significant number of people in that voting district want. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Galloway is, is, is an opportunist, of course, um, but he was giving the local electorate or part of the local electorate uh, what they want. Yeah. If you were an a, a ordinary citizen who cared about, you know, unemployment, poverty, opportunity and much more in that area, uh, you, you didn't really get a say. You didn't get anyone to vote for um, in this election. And, and it was interesting, the leaflets. Yeah, the leaflets that were put out, there were two very different whiteboards got, you know, it's all about the, I know what a woman is, Rochdale grooming gangs, the local maternity hospital, but it was the Muslims, it's all about Gaza. And he said, he said in his, his speech, you know, this was, this was a win for Gaza, and this is a city or sort of yeah. town that has huge problems, I mean, huge issues yeah. of, of, you know, poverty oh. and deprivation and desperately needs an awful lot to be dealt with. And I'm oh. not entirely sure that they should be concerning themselves almost entirely with what's going on in Gaza. I mean, that's their choice, no, I mean, but it's not going to necessarily help those people. It's all connected, though, Julia. I mean, uh, Rochdale, as most people watching will know, uh, is the scene of one of the most appalling uh, rape gang scandals in modern Britain. And uh, there's an interesting conundrum that, it, that throws itself up here, which is uh, what happens if uh, you are a voter in Rochdale who has uh, seen uh, this happen in your neighborhood, who knows it happening, who probably knows of victims, and uh, you'd like to get your voice heard. Well, well, well here are the options. Uh, you can uh, make your voice heard in the way that most of us can in democracy, which is to speak up, uh, make your voice heard by, you know, going out on the streets or attending a demonstration or something. But no, 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 no. If you did that, you would be decried as a member of the far right immediately. 
um, because you're not allowed to have a, a voice on matters like that if you happen to be uh, a particularly white and working class, let alone a white working class male, which it seems is 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 the least um, pleasant thing to be in the eyes of much of the commentariat in the UK. You're not meant to have a voice. But let's say instead of turning out on the streets or making your voice heard in opposition to rape gangs, then you waited patiently to exercise your vote in the democratic process. Well, well then you have um, a bunch of people uh, ranting about the Jews and uh, friends of Saddam Hussein and Bashar al-Assad uh, uh, all showing up and again pandering to the local Muslim vote and you don't really have a say then either. Yeah. So when Rishi Sunak and others uh, play this game of oh it's about Islamists but also the far right, yeah there are some, some far right people in the UK and they are completely on the fringes and they're disliked by everybody and they don't have any place in our democracy. They, they're not in Parliament. They don't get voted into Parliament. Rishi Sunak had to summon up the spectre of the former head of the British National Party, Nick Griffin, who's had absolutely no presence in public life for 13 or 14 years now, had to summon up hit him up like a ghoul uh, as an example of the far right. But the, I go back to this point. What if you're just a concerned voter in Rochdale yeah. who has seen the Muslim rape gangs in your area, who has seen all of the equivocation of the political class and has seen everybody who's spoken up about it decried as far right. You know, where exactly are you allowed a voice on this? Yes, where? exactly. And that's the thing. And again, I think lots of people watching that speech that Richie Snack made were sort of quite shocked by, again, these sort of, on the one hand, far right, on the one hand, Islamist extremism, when I'm not aware of the far right playing a role in our democ democratic procedures being oh. changed a couple of weeks ago as a result of the far right. The threats to MPs right now are coming from Islamist extremism, not from the far right. A teacher forced into hiding for you know, th over three years in Batley, not from the far right. A, 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 a cinema chain not showing uh, a film about to the Prophet Muhammad's family, not from the far right. I, London Bridge attacks, both of them, Westminster Bridge. I mean, you know, uh, Manchester Arena. I keep going like, yes, Joe Cox, awful, horrible, terrible murder. But really, is that all they've got? I mean, that's all they've got. Well, and, and, and yet we're going to say these things are equivalent when quite clearly they aren't. It, it, the, the British government has played this very cynical game for many years now. Um, uh, and, and again, I come back to this point. If 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 it, if there had been a far right crowd, an actually far right crowd, let's say of British National Party to again summon up that long dead spectre of the past, um, if there had been a British National Party demonstration outside the House of Commons the other week, you know, it's not like you or I or anyone else we know would have any problem condemning that either. It's like it's very simple. We wouldn't want and we don't like thugs of any kind intimidating our representatives, let alone um, threatening them. We find that perfectly easy. And if there was such a group, you and I and others wouldn't have a problem with saying we condemn this. We wouldn't have to yeah. summon up other groups to sort of allow us to condemn it. Uh, we just condemn it. Well, OK, so why... So what is well, why are the they so afraid? Here? Why are they so afraid of doing this? Because it seems to me we often hear, and again, even in Rishi Sunak's speech again, there's a lot of talk about, you know, diversity and, you know, and multi... He did, it's interesting, he did keep saying multi-ethnic rather than um, multicultural, which or multi, you know, multiracial rather than multicultural, which I thought was very interesting because for years we've been told by politicians that multiculturalism is good, diversity of itself, on its own, is a good thing. And a lot of people like me and you, uh, rather more uh, um, beautiful prose in your books, Douglas, have made the point that actually multiculturalism isn't necessarily a good thing. Multi-ethnicity, multiracial, absolutely fine, no issue there. Um, but culture is something that should be what a country defines itself by. And we, we, we like our culture, being liberal about people, people having equal rights, of whether they're white or black or women or men or gay or straight, and being able to marry someone of their faith of their choice, being able to have a religious view and, and leave that religion if they so choose without facing a death threat. Really basic stuff like that. But multiculturalism doesn't necessarily mean that, does it? No, it doesn't. But I mean, this is just so... Uh, all of this is just so past its sell-by date. Um, I mean, it's 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 almost 15 years now since Prime Minister Sarkozy, Angela Merkel and David Cameron all said that multiculturalism had failed. 
Um, and so th this is an old argument. Th th this argument has been effectively won, uh, um, i.e. lost, um, years ago. And here we still are in the UK rabbiting on about it. Yeah. And uh, why? The fact is, is that some diversity is good for a society, but there must be some point at which it no longer is. And I would say that the point at which it no longer is, is where you have communities of people who uh, hold on to the prejudices that they brought from their country of origin and then start to push it into our own political system. Worst of all is when that happens in a threatening manner, as it does with sections of the Muslim communities in this country, where effectively MPs from, and the Speaker and the Prime Minister and everyone else are intimidated yeah. from identifying the problem. You know, I'm so fed up of hearing people saying things that, you know, would have been fine 20 years ago, but are just way out of date now. The question now is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And Rishi Sunak's answer is, uh, well, we have record high migration, um, but we'll talk about what a great liberal country we are. No, that just doesn't do it. it the, a lot of people don't want to integrate in Britain, and we should have realised that by now. They don't want to be part of Britain. And what's more, when Rishi Sunak and others talk about uh, this country, they very often talk about it as if it's just, you know, our liberalism, our political liberalism is the one thing that we have going for us, in our, or, or that our diversity is actually our essence as a country. And that's just not true. Uh, Britain was not very diverse until about 60 years ago and was certainly nothing like what it is now uh, um, until the last few decades, principally since the Labour election of 1997. Um, but, the, you know, this is a country, Great Britain, with an extraordinarily long and rich history, all of which we now push aside, all of which we ignore, and we sell ourselves simply as this uber-liberal sort of landing spot for the world. World. And I don't think that passes master. No. It and and it's also, looking. it's not something the British public asked for or consented to, no. and when asked repeatedly, say, no, thank you very much. And again, that doesn't make someone racist or bigoted or, or xenophobic. It's about wanting to protect the very thing that supposedly what attracts people uh, to this country. And again, the need, as Sweden and Germany and other countries have discovered, the need to be intolerant of intolerance and stop tolerating that. Can I ask you just finally, in terms of George Galloway, which seemed to be what prompted the Prime Minister to make this speech on, on Friday, even though, of course, when Suella Bradman and Lee Anderson speak about very similar things, apparently it's totally beyond the pale and they really can't be, you know, in the government or part of the Conservative Party anymore because they're clumsy language. Um, but it seems to me that the British people don't deserve George Galloway. But it seems to me that the British political class do and that they created him they have created his success they are responsible for it and they're the ones who are going to have to do something about it do you agree well they just they oh, they're all i mean labor conservative they're all totally incapable of speaking to the public uh, they're incapable of speaking to our concerns. Uh, Rishi Sunak's speech was a good example. Any speech by any Labour MP is a very good example. Look at Jess Phillips last week um, um, talking about how wonderful uh, Birmingham is and how there are no problems in her area and how the marchers and the, pal the, the Palestinian protesters weren't any problem. You know, uh, she should look, by the way, to her constituency. She should look to Birmingham and the hate preachers preaching anti-Semitism in the mosques in Birmingham, which there's plenty of video of and she could find it if she was curious yeah. about it. But because all of these parties have ducked all of these issues, of course they leave, they leave it open. And they also pander to it. As I say, there's a reason why the Labour Party selected and then deselected somebody who was pandering to anti-Semitism. Yeah. It was because he was pandering to a voter base in Rochdale that wants anti-Semites and wants to vote for them. Um, uh, uh, if, if the best that Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer and co can do in response to that is to start talking about fundamental British values, then I'm sorry, we've lost already. It has to be said one other thing quickly, if I may. Very George quickly, Galloway yeah. was 
is a great political opportunist. I just hope that all the Muslims who voted for him are pleased that they voted for somebody who said the most slathering and slavish things about Saddam Hussein and Bashar al-Assad, two men who've killed more Muslims in recent decades than anyone else in the world. So those Muslim voters in Rochdale can feel proud of themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, they're really good Muslims. They're great brothers, great Umar. Yeah, Jeff good work, Barry. guys. Always good to talk to you. Thank you very much, Eddie. Sam Armstrong, quick word from you. Ten years ago, Douglas warned that Europe yep. was literally dying. He said it's a strange death, that our leaders were committing suicide. I cannot hold that view any more strongly now. They hate us, they hate our values, they hate what we stand for. They've replaced it with this banal, dangerous, multicultural nonsense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, let's get some more of your texts and messages that have been coming in thick and fast about this. Debbie says, unfortunately, uh, Rishi Sunak won't do anything about this. This would mean deporting people, and that's not something that we do. Philip says, Sunak has had more failed vows than Elizabeth Taylor and Zsa, Zsa Gabor combined. And Dave says he will need to grow a backbone first. I thought we were going to say grow something else first, but that too. Coming up after the break, the US Supreme Court is set to rule today on whether or not to ban Donald Trump from running for president. We'll talk about that up next. I'm Julia hartley Brew, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, sir. Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Now, just a few minutes left of the show, but let's talk about Donald Trump. The US Supreme Court is set to rule today on whether to uphold Colorado's bid to ban Donald Trump from running for the presidency ahead of Super Tuesday tomorrow, when some 16 states will decide on their candidates. Join me now to discuss this is Adam Coleman. He's a columnist at the New York Post. Thanks for joining us, Adam. 
Thank you for having me. Right, just explain just very briefly, if you would, so you know where we are with this, because this is all uh, as a result of a ruling by the Colorado Supreme Court. Yeah, right now uh, we're just we're waiting on the ruling. Um, personally, I think that uh, the Supreme Court will uh, not uphold this decision. Uh, I think Donald Trump will be able to be on the ballot for every state throughout the United States. I think this was a politically charged decision uh, to try and even move forward with something like this uh, with very little basis to do so other than saying that he incited something, um, he's loosely responsible for something, but he's not responsible for the actions of a few. Uh, if that was the case, there'd be a lot more people uh, especially involved in politics, who wouldn't be able to run for president. Well, well, indeed. I mean, they ruled in the Colorado Supreme Court in December that he couldn't stand for election because he had, quote, engaged in insurrection or rebellion as forbidden under the 14th <laughs> Amendment of the US Constitution. Even I, again, I'm not a Trump fan, would question that. But that would have, would that have prevented, this is over the Capitol riots, obviously, on January the 6th, would that have prevented him standing in any state or just one state? And could you, could you, are you not able to run for the presidency if you don't run in every state? Would no, you can still run for presidency. Colorado. So, yeah. for example, we have independent candidates who are only able to get on the ballot for certain states and not other states. Yeah. And obviously, they don't go very far. Um, but what it would have done was inspired other states who want to be politically motivated yeah. to do something like this. So, you know, that's the issue that we might face in, in our country right. is that once one state takes up an action, the other states follow suit. I can't imagine that working out very well for American democracy in terms of what, <laughs> what, the, what Trump supporters would feel uh, in that scenario. I mean, he's had a number, you know, three more victories at the weekend, although Nikki Haley finally won, you know, uh, Washington, D.C., well done her. But, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, he's got, what, got Super Tuesday, is it 15 states, I think I said 16, but 15 tomorrow that will decide. He's the runaway Republican candidate, Joe Biden, the runaway Democrat candidate. We're rerunning the last election. Um, do you think there is anything that can stop Donald Trump, even one of these court cases, getting to not just a con to court, but actually a criminal court case that leads him to an actual, possibly a criminal conviction? Do you think even that would stop him? No. Uh, personally, I thought all of this, whether it be the court cases uh, coming from Colorado, the court case in Georgia, uh, which is looking like it's quickly falling apart, I think there's been a desperate attempt to use the judicial system to go after Donald Trump and is quickly failing. Now, the only way that it has succeeded in hurting Donald Trump is that he's spending all his campaign money defending himself and legal fees, right? So if you were to look at how much money he's taking in, how much money he's spending on legal fees, it's a significant portion. Yeah. So that is one way they are hurting him and that but hold theoretically on a minute. could you, hurt come his on. chances. When he first got elected in 2016, he'd spent way less, way, way less than Hillary Clinton and he still got elected. That is very true. So money is not the, the entire indicator, but, right? But money is a significant, uh, significant factor. And if these court cases keep going on, how much more of his campaign money is it going to deplete? And, but and as the focus, we, as of course. We, yeah. And just yeah, finally, it, Nick, Nikki Haley, she's finally won. She couldn't even win in her own uh, South Carolina uh, <laughs> state where she was governor for six years, for goodness sake. She's won in D.C. It doesn't really matter. It's a tiny little constituency. She's hanging on for dear life just in the hope that something happens, Donald Trump goes by the wayside and she could be the Republican candidate. Do you think she stands a chance? Not at all. Uh, I, that's why she's hanging on to this small victory in Washington, D.C., which really doesn't matter all that much. No. The truth is that Super Tuesday is basically mediocre Tuesday. We <laughs> already know what's going to happen on both sides. OK. And in terms of even if Donald Trump got dumped as a Republican candidate, if those you know, delegates decided to vote differently, he'd run as an independent anyway, wouldn't he? Uh, I don't see. I don't know the process behind that because he might have to do something different to file to be on the ballot as an oh. independent. But I personally, I think that's so extreme. I don't ever see that happening. He's a Republican ha candidate. Full stop. Full Great. stop. He's extremely, extremely popular. Adam Coleman, really appreciate you joining us. No doubt, talk to you many more times over the coming months. He's at the New York Post. Thank you very much. Final word to Sam Armstrong. Look, he is really popular. I have to say, not top, not a uh, Donald Trump fan over the years. But I can absolutely see why someone would vote for him now and not, not for Joe Biden. I get that. Yeah, look, 
I'm really not a Donald Trump fan in many ways, but I am, he's predicted to win, and I am slightly looking forward to seeing the faces on all the usual suspects. There is that. in outrage. The there is that. There is always a part of that. Because... But again, but again, have not, have not the political classes, media classes, have they not created this phenomenon themselves? Yeah, look, Donald Trump should not exist, right? Politicians should be addressing the basic worries, concerns, fears of all. But, but he does, he does. He talks about taxes, talk about the border, and that's a massive concern. The question isn't why isn't Donald Trump doing why is Donald Trump doing well? It's why aren't other politicians yeah. addressing these same problems? Given, given his major personality failings and past, you know, and others, you'd think, you know what, if you can't stand someone better than him, I feel the same way about George Galloway. You know, if you can't do better than him, then it's your own fault. Sam Armstrong, pleasure to have had your company. Thank you for coming back on the show. Sadly, we have come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for tuning. It's been quite a lively one. Please do join me same time tomorrow. Up next, it's Kevin O'Sullivan and Alex Phillips. Have a great afternoon. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know 